Adrian M. Breitfeld, the city clerk, are hereby directed to call a regular session of the city council to be held on Monday, December 6, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic federal building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the city council. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a regular session of the Dubuque City Council for December 6, 2021. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input on the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log in to GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, Indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to when phone lines are unmuted. All phone lines will be unmuted during the consent agenda, public hearings, and public input periods, and city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the City Clerk's Office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Buell? Here. Council Members Kavanaugh? Here. Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. City Attorney Brumwell? Here. Thank you. Mayor Buell, I will turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Adrian. At this time, I would ask all who are able to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, of the United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands. stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Adrian. Under presentations, we have the COVID-19 update. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Mary Rose Corrigan. I'm public health specialist with the Health Services Department, here to give you the December 2021 COVID-19 update. And I'll just wait for the screen sharing option to come up here. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of data on where we are today over the last month this uh chart shows the amount of testing done and the amount of positive test uh, cases so the testing is indicated by the gray bars so this tells us that we've had a really good amount of testing in the community which will help reflect a true positivity rate um, you can see that it does go down a little bit on some of the weekends, and we had a lot of testing after the Thanksgiving holiday. And we still continue in high transmission rate. Last Wednesday, when the weekly totals were released, we did have a dip in cases um, significantly. Uh, aren't, weren't quite sure whether that's due to the holiday or to an actual um, decrease in cases. Um, but we right now are at about today's data says that we're at 457 cases in the last seven days. And just as a reminder, back in the middle of November, that was up to 626. And we're at a 12.8 positivity rate, uh, seven day average positivity rate. So um, I don't expect the cases um, 
to increase as high as they were on the 24th, and hopefully they will stay level or continue to go down. And the whole state continues to be in high transmission um, level, pretty much like the rest of the country. So these aren't quite comparing apples to apples, but if we look at uh, December from this time last year in 2020 to now, we can see that the cases did start to decline in about late November um, in 2020. Although those cases were reported on a daily basis, those numbers did not add up to the weekly numbers that we've been having um, during November. So we have had higher numbers of cases. And likewise, the active cases, um, when you compare them from December of 2020 to 2021, today they are about 300, two to 300 lower than last year at this time. Looking at what different age groups are being affected most recently this last week, um, the 18 to 29 year old gr age group has the most amount of cases. Now for about the past month to five weeks, the zero to 17 year old, mostly school age children were leading the count in terms of number of cases with the 18 to 29 year olds following suit. And now they have kind of flip flopped and we'll see if this number continues, but um, cases are clearly infecting um, children and young adults. So one of our biggest concerns um, locally and on a statewide basis is our hospital capacity, capability, and of course the data that comes out of them. So we want to make sure they have adequate equipment, supplies, med and medications, and staffing to care for um, all the patients that come in, and not just the COVID-19 ones. Um, the hospitals continue to work with us, uh, the incident management team cooperatively, and they collect <laughs> daily hospital data and report it to the Iowa Department of Public Health. Now in the past, oh, it's been about maybe one or two months, the Iowa Department of Public Health has stopped reporting uh, the number of county residents in the hospitals. And I, since that time, um, since the public really wanted to know, both hospitals have been reporting their weekly counts, the count they have like every Wednesday, I should say, to the incident management team and to the Telegraph Herald for publication. So, Back in April of uh, 2020, the Department of Public Health issued a mandatory reporting order, which required all hospitals to provide the information to the Iowa Department of Public Health regarding their number of patients, their bed capacity, things like PPE supply status, and other information on a daily basis. <clears throat> And the data reported to the department and its designees under this mandatory reporting order is confidential under Iowa law and may not be disclosed except as expressly authorized by the law. So there's specific patient tracking numbers and, and other um, data points that um, fall under the Iowa code section 22.7 and this data constitutes information concerning physical infrastructure, critical infrastructure, and emergency preparedness um, developed and maintained or held by the department for the protection of life or property. And local health, local public health, and other public health preparedness partners received the confidential, confidential data since it is necessary for us or these organizations to perform response and mitigation duties related to COVID-19. So this data is um, confidential and it is not to be released, um, except of course the hospitals themselves can release some of the data to the public if they so choose. So I guess the message here is that um, Yes, hospitalizations have increased over the past, well, it's been two months now. And we know that hospitalizations and deaths are a lagging indicator. So these 
typically rise after we see an increase in cases. The other thing um, is that the public health incident management team reviews the hospital numbers and is in contact with the hospitals on a regular basis. So if there would come a point where they are not able to serve um, their patients, we would be able to act and um, seek assistance from other counties or the state or federal resources to um, house and treat patients, transfer them, et cetera. And this regional medical, um, the RMCC serves as a way for hospitals to communicate to each other and know when different hospitals have open beds and et cetera. So this is how um, the hospitalizations um, played out last year at this time. They were higher than numbers we've seen um, in the last few weeks, and then they did also decline in December. So um, hopefully that will happen here locally too, but we know it is a lagging indicator, so they could remain steady. And then likewise, another lagging indicator is unfortunately the number of deaths that we experience. And we made this graph to show how um, the number of deaths has dramatically decreased since the vaccination started back in February and March. Um, these are uh, monthly death totals. We cannot publicly report a number if it is not at least five for um, confidentiality purposes, but this shows the general trend line that the deaths have significantly decreased since last November. So that is a bright spot. So on the vaccination front, our um, vaccination rate has uh, pretty much flatlined since about July. Um, I, I think this week we'll see more of an uptick I think the number of people getting vaccinated since the new variant was announced has increased. So um, right now we're at about 60% of all the Butte County residents fully vaccinated and 70% of those 12 years of age and older. And it has been a little bit confusing regarding the booster since the guidance has changed several times over the past few months, but now it's recommended that everybody ages 18 and older get a booster shot six months after their second dose or two months after their uh, dose of J&J &J vaccine, if that's, mm -hmm. if that's the one they got. And this just kind of shows the numbers as they went by month. Um, you can see that March and April and May were our big months. So the majority of people vaccinated are eligible for those boosters right now. So how are we doing? Um, so on November 29th, the CDC recommended that third dose for everyone 18 years and older. So to date, uh, 23,191 booster doses have been administered in Dubuque County. And the second um, bar graph below or chart shows um, the amount of doses given to those who are eligible for a booster, those that are 18 years and older. So of that age group, about 43, almost 44% have received their booster dose. So just when booster doses were going all right, we um, get hit with a new variant. The Omicron variant um, was identified on November 26 by the World Health Organization as a variant of concern. And on December 4th, it was identified in the United States. And now, uh, I think it's 16 states. This is as of this morning. This probably changed since this morning already. 16 states it's in and 20 countries. So CDC is actively monitoring and preparing for this variant. And just as a reminder, we know that the virus that causes COVID-19 is constantly changing. And these new variants of the virus are expected to occur. And sometimes new variants emerge and disappear. And other times they're more persistent. So how easily does Omicron spread? Well, if, 
it's likely that it will spread more easily than the original SARS-CoV-2 virus. And we're not sure how it will spread compared to Delta, but that remains the dominant variant. Delta is still by far the dominant variant around the world. Um, CDC expects that anyone with Omicron infection can spread the virus to others, even if they are vaccinated or don't have symptoms. So similarly to the other variants, it's probably gonna be that way with Omicron. Will it cause more severe illness? Well, we really don't know that yet. We'll have to wait for more data. And will the vaccines work? That's another thing we're gonna to have to wait and see um, as we gather more data and, and can look at people getting infected with this, whether or not they're vaccinated, fully vaccinated, have been boosted. There's a lot of factors. So um, CDC and World Health Organization are gonna need a few weeks worth of data to come through with some of the information and guidance. And then, you know, lastly, you wonder, will the treatments work that we have now, such as the monoclonal antibodies and the newly um, developing antivirals? And that, again, uh, remains to be seen. It's expected they all will be um, effective, however. But the best thing to do to protect yourself from this variant and others is to get vaccinated and of course, get that booster dose mm. if you're eligible. The other thing to watch for, um, especially when traveling to other countries is check the requirements for testing and quarantine frequently. These um, guidance and requirements are gonna be changing quite a bit as we just find out more about this variant. We continue to um, post all the uh, vaccination opportunities on our websites, both the county and the city website, and our um, city manager's office staff, staffs the sleeves up phone line for those who need assistance finding a vaccine or making an online appointment. Um, we also continue to list all the testing sites available. So that's all the uh, formal um, remarks I have, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Mary Rose. Anyone have any questions for Mary Rose? No? Okay, I do not see any questions here, uh, Mary Rose. Mr. Thank Mayor, you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Kavanaugh. my hand a little late there, yeah, thank you. Um, Mary Rose, this is, uh, this is Brad Kavanaugh. Um, I heard you say there's a good amount of data that you receive as a um, incident management team that the state of Iowa doesn't allow you to share on a regular basis. But then I just want to be clear about this. You said that you as an incident management team have the authority to be able to act on that data if you find it to be at a point where hospitalizations are reaching such a height that the, the hospitals might be overwhelmed. You as an incident management team can act. You don't have to go back to the state of Iowa to ask about that. Well, uh, Mr. Kavanaugh, this is Mary Rose Corrigan again. Um, I, I believe it would be a, a cooperative um, planning effort because since, since we are in frequent communication with the hospitals, if we needed state or federal resources and assistance, you know, we would have to go up through that um, chain of um, authority and um, the, the way to get resources through our emergency management agency and Tom Berger. So to get uh, federal or state assistances, we would have to um, go through that process. But if, if we feel the need that the hospitals are not able to you know, handle um, what's coming into them for a variety of reasons, whether it's staffing or beds or uh, resources, PPE, any of those numbers, we can come up with a plan to deal with that. And of course we would do it in conjunction with the hospitals, but they really need our um, assistance um, because it does get funneled up through the uh, emergency management agency, which is, which is part of our incident management team. Does that answer your question? I think it does. I, I guess my basic question was, you know, the, the state of Iowa is limiting your ability to share information, even though you have that information. 
But it sounds like you are able to act upon that information in cooperation with uh, community hospitals and, and I, I guess, you know, us as a city government and then as well as the county government if we need to. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Um, you can be assured that we, we do get the full report on a daily basis. And so um, it is transparent with us. And, you know, releasing a lot of that, it, it is complicated because um, a hospital may have, uh, you know, a lot of open beds, but their staffing may be down or so it, it would be difficult mm -hmm. data to explain and present to the public without a lot of explanation on what it it really means. And so it, it's a total, total picture, but it, it is part of the monitoring system. And it's, you know, it was set up a long time ago um, when we first started doing preparedness activities you know, in the early 2000s, we created a reporting system for hospitals. It wasn't every day, of course, but they did report um, things like their bed availability and, and different aspects. So no matter what emergency would present itself, we would have a clear picture of, you know, our capacity to treat ill or injured people or whatever the uh, emergency was. So the system's been in place for a long time and it's similar to, you know, local public health and health officials getting specific disease reporting data on individuals. You know, we have a lot of that, and that is also confidential, obviously, for health and um, in individual confidentiality reasons. Um, but usually when you get into the planning um, stages and execution of this kinds of things, it, it does it's necessary to keep it that way so it can be done, um, you know, in collect collaboration with the players that are involved. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mary Rose, for that update. I uh, hope the next one is even better. <laughs> Thank you. You too, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Adrian. We'll move on to proclamations, and we have one, the Eradication of Generational Poverty Day. Okay, and who is accepting this? Caprice, would you like to come up? Would you like to speak to the proclamation? Please introduce yourself first, though, for the record. <laughs> okay. My name is Caprice Jones. I live on 440 Klingenberg Terrace. I'm the executive director of the Founder Youth Program. And I just wanted to speak to, um, to just say thank you for an opportunity to um, highlight the need for um, the push for eradication of generational poverty to always be a constant reminder you know, throughout um, each year that goes by. Um, you initially um, approved it back in 2017, and we want to continue to get this um, recognized every year so we won't lose sight on um, that no one deserves to be uh, left out. So, thank you. You bet, thank you for being here this evening to accept this proclamation. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas the Fountain of Youth Program was founded five years ago and has planted its roots in the downtown community of Dubuque. And whereas the Fountain of Youth Program aims to change the mindsets that contribute to generational poverty. And whereas it is the goal of the Fountain of Youth program to eradicate generational and situational poverty from our community. And whereas the greatest impact can be made through the joint efforts of community organizations, government, and the citizens of the community. Now therefore, I, Roy D. Buell, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and citizens of Dubuque, to hereby proclaim the seventh day of December, 2021, as Eradication of Generational Poverty Day in the City of Dubuque, Iowa. Okay, Adrian. We will move on to consent items. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone 
when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. And consent items can be found on pages two through six of the agenda. Thank you, Adrian. Is there anyone in the chambers who would like anything on that consent agenda held for separate discussion? See, no one. Is there anyone uh, virtually that wants anything held? We do not have any input on this item. Okay. And no emails received. Okay, thank you very much. I'll bring it back to the table then for any discussion. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Resnick. Yes, I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended. Second by Sprank. Motion by Mr. Resnick, second by Mr. Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion carries 7 0. We will move on to items set for public hearing, and we have two. First is fiscal year 2022 annual action plan amendment number two public hearing. And second is vacate portion of Tanzanite drive slash right of way easement alt house agreement to vacate easement both for December 20th, 2021. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel, please. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolutions and set the public hearings for December 20th. Second by Farber. Motion by Mr. Roussel, second by Ms. Farber. Uh, Adrian, would you call the roll please? Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion carries 7-0. Public hearings will be held in the council chambers on the dates and the times indicated. We will move on to boards and commissions, and we have applicant review for the Civic Center Advisory Commission, the Historic Preservation Commission, and the Investment Oversight Advisory Commission. Okay, is there anyone uh, in the chambers or virtually that would like to address the application of Brenda Christner for the Civic Center Advisory Commission? Uh, yes, uh, this is Brenda Christner. Okay. I am a recent, oh, I live at 655 Florence Street in Dubuque. Um, I'm a recent resident of Dubuque. I moved here from Iowa City. I have been um, in my past life. I was a manager of the Johnson County Fairgrounds, uh, production manager at Pearson's and a graphic designer. Um, I believe in community service. I volunteered and was elected uh, as vice president of the Iowa City Community Theater for several years. I managed um, Young Footlighters, a children's theater for 15 years and I've worked with other groups, um, all for extended periods of time. I want to volunteer um, in the Dubuque area. Um, COVID kind of stopped me from getting involved sooner, um, but lucky for me, Dubuque has this awesome program of city life. I thought, um, I just uh, graduated in November, just last month. It is an amazing program and would recommend it and have been recommended to all the people that I know. Um, it's, it was a wonderful way to get to know Dubuque. Um, because of my previous experience, I feel confident in working with the Civic Center Commission. At the fairgrounds, I was in charge of creating and maintaining a balanced budget. I set rental fees. Um, I recommended capital improvements and general maintenance and coordinated quotes, uh, selected builders, and made sure the completion was on time and was satisfaction. I also found creative ways to keep our buildings and grounds rented, um, such as filling a building that was rarely used in the winter with a um, winter's farmer's market that the Iowa City did not do on its own. And we worked well together on that. I worked as a with a team of um, to book entertainment for the fair, uh, such as rodeos, main stage events, children's events, the Bill Riley show, an assortment of things. Um, I've done a lot of things with a lot of different groups of people and would think that I could be an asset for the Civic Center Commission. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Brenda, for your applications. Anyone have any questions for Brenda? Okay, thank you very much, Brenda. 
Sure, thank you. Okay, we'll move on into the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, we have one opening and one applicant, uh, Janice Esser. Is there anyone in the chambers or virtually to address that application? Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll move on to the Investment Oversight Advisory Commission. And again, we have one opening and one applicant, uh, Joshua Merritt. Is there anyone in the chambers or virtually to address that application? Okay, we'll move on then, Adrian. We will now move on to public hearings. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items, please plan to approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. And public hearing number one is 2022 John F. Kennedy Road Sidewalk Installation Project. Can I get a motion? Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Cameron. Mr. Mayor. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Uh, both resolutions, and I apologize. Second by Jones. Okay, motion by Mr. Cavanaugh, second by Mr. Jones. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Since 1999, there have been discussions in the community concerning sidewalks along John F. Kennedy Road between Asbury Road and the Northwest Arterial. Numerous petitions were received both for and against the installation of sidewalks. At the July 2nd, 2018 City Council meeting, the City Council voted five to two to proceed with the installation of sidewalks with city staff directed to proceed with the development of a sidewalk installation project and use special assessments to fund the project. In October 2018, the project failed to get the required unanimous support from the City Council, failing on a five to two vote. At their May 17, 2021 meeting, the City Council unanimously agreed city staff provide the City Council with an updated John F. Kennedy Road sidewalk project. This is the fourth time the John F. Kennedy Road sidewalk installation issue has been presented to the City Council for consideration. The other times that the City Council considered the JFK sidewalks was July of 1999, December of 2007, and October of 2018. The project was brought to the City Council for consideration on June 7, 2021. The project was approved to have plans developed and go to bidding. At the July 6, 2021 City Council meeting, City staff requested the bidding process stop in order to pursue a Transportation Alternatives Program, or TAP grant. The grant can be used for Safe Routes to Schools project, of which this project qualifies. In July 2021, the City of Dubuque was, a notif was notified it will receive a $190,000 grant to be used toward the Safe Routes to School project on John F. Kennedy Road. Additionally, Community Development Block Grant funds will be used to provide financial assistance to owner-occupied homes that meet income guidelines for lower moderate income. Based on the sidewalk cost and respective engineering and contingency cost after the grant is applied, sidewalk assessments total $80,526.54. The sidewalk portion of the assessment to property owners is reduced 54% from the previous calculated assessments due to the TAP grant. Those assessments were calculated from earlier in 2021. The TAP grant provides a significant savings to the abutting property owners. This project includes the $190,000 grant the City of Dubuque received, <clears throat> paying all the costs for the construction of the John F. Kennedy Road retaining walls. Previously, the retaining walls were to be assessed to the abutting property owner. This is a savings of $75,450.04 to the abutting property owners requiring retaining walls. City of Dubuque staff are working on a program where income qualified owner occupied residents who are unable to remove snow from the public sidewalk could work with volunteers to clear snow and ice. This program would be coordinated with the city's engineering and the AmeriCorps staff. A website is being developed. 
Availability of help would be completely dependent on the number of volunteers willing to assist. The estimated assessments, including contingency and engineering, for a 100-foot lot would be $2,219, or $22.19 per lineal foot. City Engineer Gus Ahoyas recommends City Council approval of a resolution of necessity and approval of the preliminary schedule of assessments for the 2022 John F. Kennedy Road sidewalk installation project. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. Now we are in a public hearing to consider City Council approval of a resolution of necessity <coughs> and approval of the preliminary schedule of assessments for the 2022 John F. Kennedy Road sidewalk installation project. Is there anyone in the chambers to address the council on this issue? Okay, please uh, come to the podium. Uh, you'll be allowed five minutes. Just state your name and address. And then if the next, if there's another person, if you could just line up over by the wall so when they're finished, we can keep it moving. <clears throat> I'm Sherry Clancy. I live at 2691 Marywood Drive in Dubuque here. Again, time for round four on the sidewalk issue. So the citywide mandate they said would happen in 2018 before this was brought up again meant that the city council decided it should be brought up again. It could be done without anything changing regarding the necessity of this financial burden to the property owners. I read with interest the story in the November 13th Telegraph Herald regarding the momentum build for apartment complex where they're looking to build two 28 units apartment buildings behind the Kennedy Mall on Bees Drive. There are no sidewalks on Bees Drive and the new buildings are supposedly for more housing to help the workforce. I have read that a retaining wall, wouldn't you know it, is to be placed on our property. Why are they now proposing that my stretch of JFK needs a retaining wall when the reason the ground slopes down there is because when they widened JFK before we bought the house in 1991, it was never properly leveled off. It has never bothered the city to throw the snow and chemicals from JFK down through our chain link fence and into our yard. So why now is it that a retaining wall is needed? The city may pay to put in a retaining wall on my land, but I, I am expected to maintain it. And where do you think the chemicals and snow are going to go trying to keep this unnecessary sidewalk cleared of snow and ice. I'm not putting any more chemicals into my lawn than the snowplow has already been placing there with every pass on the street for the past 30 years. When we bought the house in 1991, there was a wooden fence at the end of our chain link fence to almost the corner of Marywood. The wooden fence was replaced twice because the snow and the chemicals have destroyed it twice. The wood does not stand up to it. Some of the bushes on the property line have also become victims of the chemicals and have died. This year they patched a corner of JFK right at the corner of Marywood and put down a grass netting out there. It was still laying there in June with light grass coming up through it. Normally when you see that placement, the grass grows quickly and you don't see the netting sitting there yet. That is where the snow sits when I clean my corner of the sidewalk so it mounts up and the chemicals from the street sit there until it melts away into the ground or runs down the street and the sidewalk. I have cut the grass out there for 30 years. We have lived here and I rarely do, do I have anyone walk on our side of the street. There is a sidewalk on the other side of JFK by the Kennedy Park West Apartments and no one walks there either. 
The kids that live in the complex there do not ever walk down the street. They walk behind the building and go down Sunset Park Circle to the corner of JFK and up JFK to the lights and cross over at the crosswalk to get to Eisenhower. My three kids all went to Eisenhower for grade school and my youngest started in preschool there and they all walked down Marywood and took the Chrissy path to go behind school. I would never let them walk down JFK because speeding cars can jump the curb and do so frequently in the wintertime. 12 to 15,000 dollars, 15,000 cars going 30 miles an hour a day on JFK does not make the street a residential street. It isn't safe for anyone to walk, much less any school-aged children. Since we bought our property in 1991, there have been two more subdivisions built across from Eisenhower on JFK. And if these sidewalks were so necessary, why were they not brought up at that time? I'm sure the people living in those subdivisions have their students at Eisenhower, and I can't imagine having my child walk across JFK to Spring Valley to walk to school or to cross there on the hill and walk down JFK, down the, <coughs> excuse me, the JFK side to the playground. A couple of years ago, going up JFK towards Asbury by the guardrail, a van flipped over the guardrail and landed on the fence in someone on Gordon Drive's yard. They have never replaced the fencing, only have a temporary snow type fencing in place years after this has happened. The bus stop housing was wiped out by somebody coming up JFK and across the road took out the housing unit. The bus stop pad is still there and occasionally the bus will actually stop and let a rider off. The house built above our house houses a handicapped person and she rides the jewel bus and they stop at the driveway for her to get on on the crest of the hill. They had to put in a sidewalk when they built the house so she could walk to the bus stop on sidewalk, but the bus stops at her driveway so she doesn't have to use it anyway. In April this year, a person had their vehicle roll out of the Sullivan chiropractic lot across the street and smash our fence down. Luckily, there were no other vehicles or her persons hurt, only the property damage to my fence. Can, can I have you wrap it up or you have, you're already at your five minutes. Thank you. I have a huge chunk of the road cement that was thrown into our yard from the middle of JFK by the snowplow, and it flew a distance from the spot in the road where it came to land in the grass. They put blacktop in the hole to fix it in June this year. Perfect timing for this issue to come up again with the pandemic and people working from home or not working, period, and then expecting us to come up with the extra funds to pay for this when it's an unnecessary expense and will not be used. It is very much a hardship when people work two to three jobs and still live paycheck to paycheck and expect them to finance this project when it's a waste of their hard-earned money. My husband is retiring in January 2022 after working 34 years for the state of Iowa due to medical disability. He has, eight, has had eight back surgeries and one neck surgery and being medically retired will put us on a fixed income. We are not retirement age and are stressing the financial hardship of this so I can't even imagine how the elderly homeowners are expected to pay and maintain this totally unnecessary sidewalk. Thank you. Okay, thank you. These are pictures of the snow. Some of them I sent you an email, the others I didn't, and this is the rock. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Jolene Rettenberger, and my husband and I reside at 2291 Gordon Drive for the past 33 and a half years. We wish to express our opposition to the placement of sidewalks along JFK Road, particularly in our steep backyards, which also is a start of a guardrail. Prior to the JFK Road construction in 1986, a guardrail existed on the east side from the former Goodwill Store driveway down to Kaufman Avenue. Afterwards, residents petitioned the city to reinstall the guardrail. City engineers found the slope at the rear of our lots were steep enough to require a guardrail, a 32 degree incline. It was also found necessary to install curved breakaway end sections to prevent vehicles from getting behind the guardrail or being speared by a straight end section. As noted earlier, tonight does mark round number four. And at this time, I would like to recap a few comments that were shared throughout the years um, from various council members. 
July 7th of 1999. This is the first time I think we've had 100% opposition anywhere, said Councilmember Voltberg. Councilmember Buell shared, I've never gotten a call on that section of Kennedy Road. I don't see a need for it myself. Councilmember Mikowski said she believed adding sidewalks actually would compromise pedestrian safety along that stretch of Kennedy Road. A guardrail between the roadway and adjacent properties would have to be shifted to accommodate the sidewalk, rendering it a less effective barrier. Mayor Duggan said the argument some senior residents posed that adding sidewalks along their properties would pose a heavy burden in terms of shoveling snow was a valid one. To clear the accumulated plowed snow from the four lane road, residents would probably need a snowblower like we have at the airport. Comments from August 7 of 2007. I've always said we can have exemptions. Other neighborhoods have gotten exemptions, said Council Member Bragg. Council Member Lynch voted for the project, but questioned it if sidewalks along the busy roadway really were a safety issue. I still have not heard anything to convince me that, is, that this is any more than a want, not a need, he said. December 18, 2007. The proposal that would have mandated sidewalks on property along Kennedy Road from Asbury Road to the Northwest Arterial was put together at his request, Councilmember Jones said, because he got calls from people who thought the city should provide for pedestrian traffic along the route. He won't apologize for bringing the issue to the table, but after hearing residents' objections, he also said he won't do it again. Hearing the residents' objections and council members' unwillingness to support the project, Mayor Buell promised, if this comes back again, I'll make sure the neighbors are talked to before city engineers are notified. Council Member Mikowski encourages the city to look at the hardship plowing causes along arterials that are essentially public ways. February 20th, 2018. We'll have to figure out what the accurate traffic and pedestrian counts are and carefully consider the cost, Council Member Jones said. Every citizen should be able to walk safely where they choose to walk, but I'm not sure how we do it in this particular circumstance. Council Member Del Toro said he did not see a need for the sidewalks. From a school access perspective, I think we do have a safe means to get kids to and from school that keeps them off JFK, Del Toro said. Dubuque Community School District spokesman Mike Sy said, students currently travel to and from Eisenhower via routes that minimize their time on JFK, and they cross in an area staffed by a school crossing guard. While traffic along JFK has increased somewhat since 2009, only one pedestrian injury has been recorded since 2008, according to city records. July 3rd, 2018. Recognizing the hardship this might impose on property owners who live on block of Gordon Drive, whose backyards abut JFK, the city has agreed to take on snow shoveling responsibilities on JFK for those residents. The approval came via a five to two vote with council members Rios and Del Toro opposed. Council members Del Toro and Rios said they opposed the project because it unfairly targeted residents without establishing a universal sidewalk installation policy. November 2nd, 2018, the Governor's Highway Safety Association noted that pedestrian deaths increased by 27% from 2007 to 2016. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety and Highway Loss Data Institute reported that from 2009 to 2016, the biggest jumps in pedestrian fatalities occurred in urban areas, up 54%, on arterials, 67%, non-intersections, 50%, and during darkness, 56%. June 22, 2021, City Council voted seven to zero to postpone sidewalk installation project and also voted to allow the city to apply for a $190,000 federal grant. Council member Resnick shared at meeting, we don't have a consistent, we have a flexible city sidewalk policy. October 3rd, 2021, Dubuque secures the $190,000 grant. In closing, there has been some talk about the possibility of exemptions. 
under Chapter 1, Section 10-1-2, Sidewalk Insulation and Repair, it is noted that upon application and for good cause shown, the city manager may grant a full or partial exemption to the above requirement. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I'm Charles Winterwood, 1555 Montrose Terrace. I'm president of Tri-State Trail Vision. I'd like to remind the council that Dubuque has a complete streets policy. That means the streets are supposed to be not just for vehicles, but for pedestrians also. And uh, I would like to see, as with Tri-State Trail Vision, the sidewalks built along JFK. Thank you. Hello, Robert Biggin. I uh, live at 3253 Arrowwood Lane. Um, I own property, two properties on JFK. I own 3037 JFK and uh, 3057 JFK. Um, I know safety has been brought up quite a bit um, about this. There are probably, I don't know the exact number, but I want to say over 100 streets in Dubuque that do not have sidewalks. Um, I believe there are two council people that have uh, live in homes that do not have sidewalks in front of them. So if safety was the number one issue, then all um, places and all homes in Dubuque should have sidewalks in front of them. Um, not just targeting one street or one area of town. Um, <clears throat> their cost, I believe that the cost should be shared if there is gonna be a mandate. Um, I've, been, I've lived in Dubuque a majority of my life and I've seen how much Dubuque has grown. I remember when there was no arterial, uh, when there was no housing. I actually lived in you know, houses that were built after the first round of uh, sidewalk discussions. Um, I lived there for a long time. Um, I do travel JFK almost daily, um, probably two to three times a day. Uh, and I travel 32nd Street, my wife and I both. We both have noticed that there's definitely more people that walk on 32nd Street. I don't know if it's due to demographics, um, but there's more people and I would, I don't have any data to support it, but I believe that if you look at the landscape of 32nd Street versus JFK, it would be a lot more dangerous to walk on 32nd Street versus JFK. So why, why are we not talking about you know, sidewalks on that street or Peru Road? Um, and I know that if you would mandate sidewalks on 32nd Street, the cost for those residents would be overwhelming and I think it'd be irresponsible. Um, I've, I guess I would ask that the council, if you, I would ask that someone to vote no to this, to this because, <clears throat> um, excuse me, <clears throat> because I feel like there should be a citywide mandate and there should be something very consistent and on paper on why certain areas should have sidewalks and some shouldn't. And I believe that the city should have some skin in the game and should pay for a portion of the sidewalks. I know as growing up, my parents had always told me, you know, it's always easier to spend someone else's money. And now that, you know, when you have children, you definitely learn that. So I think if, if both it was equitable for the property owners and for the people putting sidewalks in, you know, it would definitely be more equitable. Um, <clears throat> also, I don't live on Gordon Drive, but I have been over there and seen what, what those people would have to deal with in order to shovel the snow on the sidewalks. I think you're putting an undue burden on those people um, to ask them to literally have to walk all the way around um, a several, you know, two city blocks to get there. Um, in my neighborhood, my neighbors that live right across the street, they do have sidewalks in their backyard, but they're very easy to access. Uh, they can actually walk around a sidewalk to get there or they can actually go through their yard. The people on Gordon Drive can't. It's definitely an undue burden. Um, I know uh, Mike said, Mike, uh, City Manager Van Milligan said that the cost was going to be 54% less with this $190,000 grant. Um, I did. I was proactive. I got three different construction companies to give me bids, um, and they were between $4,000 and roughly $4,400. Uh, the amount that I'm getting assessed um, from the city would be was, was almost $3,800. That's not a 54% savings. 
Um, I feel like there's a better way to do it, a more cost-effective way. Um, like I said, I've lived in Dubuque a long time. People in Dubuque are very judicious with their money. The city is very judicious with money, but we need to have a compromise that fits all parties. And like I said, I guess I would just ask that someone say no, not, not based on, but based on the fact that we need something consistent, we need someone to be a leader and, and have a citywide mandate on actually how to address this issue, not just targeting one area of town. Um, I think that's about it. Um, thank you for your time. And also thank you, Mayor Buell, for your service. Thank you. Mayor, council members, my name is Bill Stoffel. My wife and I, Jan, I'll represent a petition drive that was started years ago of 485 people. Welcome to Sidewalks 4.0. I'm sure you're aware of the background of the sidewalk issues on JFK. The last effort, though not the first, was in 2018. As I said, it took 485 citizens of the surrounding neighborhoods to bring this petition to begin the process of putting sidewalks on JFK. We weren't asking for the entire city to do this. Of all of the sidewalks in the city, it was just our area. While a few of the neighbors have since voluntarily installed sidewalks, after initially voicing opposition, that stretch of road still remains a dangerous safety issue. The paths and lawns where people walk out of necessity are still clearly there. Our citizenry base has become more aware of the health benefits of walking and biking, and COVID has taught us that being outside is a lifestyle change that will be with us long into the future. Access to the Arboretum and the expanding bike paths all along the arterial with possible access to downtown Dubuque and the Mississippi River is still blocked by a lack of a sidewalk continuum. In the neighborhoods around JFK, there are those with people who have been in their homes for 40 years, as have we. And there are people with young families moving in. Our ward number two polling place is located at Summit Congregational Church. You can't get there by walking. You have to take a car. And requires a lot of care to get there. People of all ages will benefit from these sidewalks. <clears throat> From personal experience with aging eyes, we know even at dusk when the traffic count is very high after work, there are still people using JFK for walking or biking. We have even noticed several individuals have taken to wearing reflective vests like construction workers. It is frightening to us the possibility of grave danger coupled with the omnipresent use of cell phones, not only to people using the roadway, but to drivers like us as well. We have lived in the neighborhood since 1979 and sent our three children to Eisenhower School. In the early years, there were hardly any cars. Kids walked to school. Nowadays, for an hour between 8.30 and 9.30 and between 2.30 and 3.30, it's like Kinnick Stadium getting out. You, can, you can't access the roads hardly. People are driving their kids to school all the time. Uh, the roadway and the side streets, they're literally heavily congested for that hour before and after school. The 2017 City of Dubuque Comprehensive Plan referenced the improvements to sidewalks as a city goal 22 times, specifically mentioning JFK sidewalks several times. We have spent $380,000 for that study and still nothing has been done. We need to start somewhere. While we're not aware if the plan has resulted in sidewalks in the rest of the city, we are still waiting for our needs to be properly addressed. We thank you for the chance to bring our concerns yet again to the council. We also ask and thank you for your dedicated work as council members. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the chambers to address us? Okay, do we have anyone uh, virtually that wants to address the council? We do not have any comments on this item.
And Mr. Mayor, I would like to acknowledge some public input that has been received sure. just for the record. Uh, the city clerk has received uh, public input from the following individuals um, in opposition to sidewalks. Larry Yautzi, Margie McDonald of 2548 Rosewood Drive, LaVon Janke Cohen on behalf of her mother, Virginia Janke, 3199 JFK Road, Sherry Clancy, 2691 Marywood Drive, and two petitions opposing sidewalks submitted by Jolene Rettenberger, 2291 Gordon Drive on December 1st, 2021. And the city clerk has also received public input from Jan and Bill Stoffel, 2905 Fox Hollow Road. All public input has been um, submitted to the city council and uploaded to the agenda item. Thank you. Okay, I'll bring it back to the table for any discussion. Ms. Roussel. Uh, thank you. Um, my discussions on this very challenging topic began back in early 2019 when I was campaigning. And I heard from many, many residents who have asked for sidewalks in this area for many reasons. And I've done a lot of research and I've listened to concerns from residents on both sides of the issue and had a couple things I wanted to share. Um, I believe that providing safe places for people to walk is an essential responsibility of government entities. And it's our job to make sure people have safe places to walk for many reasons. I spent many years working for a public utility and from that perspective, I learned that safety always has to have a top priority even though it might be unpopular or inconvenient. And we should never wait for an accident before we implement things we know will help with safety. I have a sidewalk at my home and I have neighbors with sidewalks front and back. I don't know how many people walk there, but I know that as a member of the community and a homeowner, I needed to make that available. I know there are seven streets in the community with similar traffic levels and all have sidewalks except JFK, including Pennsylvania and Asbury. And I think we've worked really hard to listen and respond to the citizen input on this issue. We've had public hearings, neighborhood gatherings, received and responded to individual emails and phone calls. And in response, we have received the grant to help with retaining walls. We have a number of affordability issues and even started an, an innovative new volunteer sidewalk shoveling program, which of course will take some time to get started. But I think it shows that we've really listened to the needs of the people that would be impacted. And sometimes there are costs with, associated with being part of a community, but I think that comes with benefits as well. And I hope that our efforts would be helpful to the residents that are impacted because I think it is time to get this done. But um, I also wondered if, um, Mr. Van Milligan, if you might address um, some of the things that uh, talk about the, the citywide initiative that we do have that, um, that will help us to get more sidewalks across the community. I think um, John Deans from Engineering had a couple um, projects or programs that, that people might wanna know about that we are working to get sidewalks um, across the community. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Mike, if you'd like to address that now. Thank you. Um, so uh, City Engineer Gus Sahoyas and uh, City Engineer John Deanster are uh, participating in the mean, uh, meeting virtual, virtually, and I'm gonna ask if one of them would address the question, please. So, this is city engineer Gus Zahoyas. So some of our initiatives for all new um, street projects going forward, um, sidewalks are required on both sides and we've uh, adhered to that um, consistently on all projects that have curb and gutter work. So for instance, um, Chevenel Road that we're constructing right now, there's several areas that there wasn't a sidewalk. In fact, most areas didn't have sidewalk. So as part of that whole um, $2 million project, sidewalks are included in that whole um, industrial portion between the Northwest Arterial and um, Radford Road. Um, all street projects that we've done um, in the past have had sidewalks and, and a lot of retaining walls were required 
and those even the section of John F. Kennedy Road between Pennsylvania in the past and Asbury Road when we widened that program project. Uh, we had um, installed several retaining walls along that corridor and put sidewalks along that stretch of roadway. And um, one of the other programs that we've had that the council adopted a few years ago that if anybody does an improvement on their um, home as far as an addition, um, we require sidewalks. So that's uh, enabled the city to, to um, do a lot of different areas and add sidewalks in there. And uh, John, you want to talk about anything else that we've done? Well, this is John Deans, the civil engineer uh, with the city. I, I'm involved with um, a number of, of efforts related to complete streets and, and sidewalks. I'm, we're involved with the our ADA ramp projects that we do, that the city pays for those, and we do those ramps. And just like on JFK, we are going to be doing the ramp, all the ramp related work, um, ADA ramp related work. Uh, we've been involved with trails. We've been involved with um, sidewalks. We currently are doing a lot of stump and sidewalk replacements around the city. So one of the things that was changed is all of those areas with, with tree stumps, the city's uh, assuming those costs to take care of replacing those those walks behind those stumps that may have been may have pushed up the the sidewalk and making those ADA compliant that was the decision that the council agreed to um, so there there there's a, a number of complete street uh, um, efforts that engineering will be you know requesting the council uh, to look at in the next uh, in the next budget cycle as well as in, up, in upcoming years, uh, one of the things was brought about was 32nd Street. That is a corridor that we're looking at as well. Um, and uh, we, uh, you know, engineering staff as well are involved. We are working with uh, Tri-State Trail Vision and, and Charlie Winterwood and others uh, talking about different uh, options for um, improving pedestrian access as well as provi providing uh, improvements for uh, bicycle facilities as well. So this is uh, Gus Sahoyas, again, city engineer. And one of the things that uh, Mr. Stoffel mentioned back when we, the last time we took JFK to city council, there was um, 10 property owners, I believe, that voluntarily put sidewalks in on their own. So that's another thing. And then just recently uh, near Irving School, I had a letter from a concerned citizen that there was um, three sidewalks that weren't on one of the side streets and I wrote them a letter and encouraged them to put the sidewalks in and originally they said they weren't going to do it and they all agreed to voluntarily put sidewalks in so there is pockets you know random pockets in town that people ask for sidewalks and uh, some of the, the residents do comply with those requests okay thank you very much um, any more Yes, Ms. Susan. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, um, I want to thank everybody for coming to uh, share your concerns and all of your research and um, the information that you provided I thought was very well done. So thank you again for that. Um, and um, I want to thank Laura for her comments. And I do agree that it is an overall benefit to the community uh, to have these sidewalks. And similar to uh, Laura, I actually went out and talked to some of the folks that live along JFK. And the majority of the concerns that were expressed to me were based on financing, uh, and especially during the post-COVID recovery. And I found that they were very amenable if we could delay the process of when these sidewalks would be installed to give them a better time to organize their financing. And as we looked at the opportunities, the city has put together opportunities for those in lower income levels to have grants to help them with this financing. And then also with the 15 year program for the rebate, uh, that is very, very compelling. Uh, if these prices are divided by say $2,200, you divide that by 15, you divide that by 12, a little bit of financing charge in there, it's not even $20 a month. So in the longer term for some of those folks, 15 to $20 a month is much greater is a benefit to them more so than having to pay a few thousand dollars. Um, and then 
to answer the other question, the benefit is if you wanted to do it individually, it may cost less than the city, then that gives people time between now and next June to actually get that done. So um, I think it's, again, I'm very supportive uh, of the benefit to the community. Thank you, thank you. though, for coming here. Mr. Resnick. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. I remember driving along JFK and saw a gentleman in a wheelchair, Vietnam veteran in the wheelchair with a very tall orange flag in the street trying to get up JFK. And I'm thinking, why? Why, why? why is it this way? I think it's clear that sidewalks are needed and long overdue. I mean, this is a very busy street surrounded by large neighborhoods full of people. Uh, this is obviously a, a spot that just needs uh, sidewalks. Um, I'm very happy that the city identified these TAP grants because uh, th there is going to be some burden. There is a burden to everyone in Dubuque who has sidewalks in front of their homes, and, uh, and that's almost everybody. But, of course, not everybody. But those, uh, everybody who is uh, on a busy street surrounded by large neighborhoods, they absolutely need sidewalks. And I appreciate that as a, um, something the, the citizens do, keep them clean so that uh, people can get out and use them. So I'm, I'm glad this is coming again to us. It's clearly needed, as I said, and I'm, I'm looking forward to um, uh, the different things, the programs that we can help our good citizens who are in difficult situations, I know. Uh, and we've heard about that very well presented uh, tonight again. So thank you for bringing your concerns. If you hadn't have done this, we wouldn't be able to identify these funds. We wouldn't be able to identify the process. So it's, uh, so it's been uh, really good of you to bring this. Hopefully it's been of some worth to you and this will be a very worthwhile to the community. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You bet, thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Mayor. Oh, Mr. Kavanaugh? Well, well public, public, in, oh yeah, you can, yeah, exactly, sorry. <laughs> I meant to do that after the, the public hearing. Thank you, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and start while um, sure. Ms. Burbach takes those down. Um, so thank you, and, and thank you everybody for coming here tonight and for being able to, to speak on this issue. So, um, you know, those of us that are newer to the council, we could, we could see this one coming. We knew this was going to be an issue that came before us at some point. And, uh, you know, I just want to, I want to speak personally for a moment because I, I worked really hard on this one to try and not make my mind up before this issue came before us. And uh, part of the reason is I actually have a lot of personal uh, experience on this particular issue. My first house in my life was on Kimberly. Uh, I grew up on Graham Circle. Uh, when I, my legs were younger, I ran a lot, and I was a runner at Hempstead, and had I logged many, many miles at, on JFK, um, all all areas of JFK. I know the experience of running on that street without sidewalks, but I tried not to let that be a part of this decision for me personally as I started to think about this. Um, you know the. The hardest things that come before us, in my experience at least as a council, are are the issues that are that involve personal interests and personal property versus the interests of the community at large. Um, you know, as a homeowner, I can absolutely identify with costs rising for whatever reason and how that is difficult. And it's far more difficult for some people than it is for others. And that's just a reality, and we know that. And it makes it really hard. And it's something I think about. You know, the point you made, um, Mr. Biggins, I believe, when you were talking about spending other people's money, it's something that I think, at least in my experience, we all take very seriously up here, and I know I do. But you know, this is one of those issues um, where when you think about the community benefit versus what it means to each individual homeowner personally, um, even with all the evidence that you have lined up and that I very much appreciated looking at, uh, looking forward, I just can't see how this isn't a community benefit to be able to put the sidewalks here on JFK. Um, and for that matter, other streets that don't have them. Just because we're here right now doesn't mean we're not going to be back here talking about this again with other streets that don't have sidewalks either in the future. I do think um, it's unfortunate that it's taken until now to really have this discussion and get to this point. 
Um, you know, this was a county road a long, long time ago. Most of the houses that you, that you live in, most of the homes are built in the 50s and 60s. And that was a time when cars were king. I mean, it was a time when we didn't think about the fact that people were going to need to continue to walk places because it was cars that were going to get them there. So that's why JFK is essentially a highway in the middle of town. And it's a challenge now that we're dealing with across the whole stretch of the, of the street, not just where you live, but also where all the, the major commerce is. Because we are starting to think about the fact that we need to build roads, not just for cars, but for people, for bikes, for the animals we love that we're walking with us. We need to have sidewalks in places where we can make sure that people are able to walk safely. Your safety concerns are noted. Um, those are things that I think we need to think about as we start to design sidewalks in places like your neighborhood. But I also think that the community benefit in this case and, and, and likely in a lot of other cases is it outweighs the, the situation for, for each individual homeowner. And I don't say that lightly because those are the difficult decisions that we have to make sitting here. So for that reason, I am gonna be voting for this tonight and um, I'm looking forward to seeing this project move forward. And also, as Mr. Resnick pointed out, looking forward to the possibility that we can find other funding streams to be able to help people with costs going forward, because that is absolutely important. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Frank? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I, my heart goes out to you for folks. This isn't a fun situation. This is something that you kind of been seeing coming, unfortunately. Um, but I, I do have to admit this, uh, when I was growing up and would come to Dubuque and go dr drive down JFK, I could never understand this busy street not having sidewalks. It just made no sense to me why this was this way. And I'm like, okay, it's not my town. I, I don't get it. Um, and now I've come to understand why we've gotten to the situation that we have. It's, it's something that unfortunately we have to resolve and we'll probably use it as the next as kind of our litmus test to how we can make this happen and elsewhere in the community. Um, particularly, I know Pru, the folks that live on Pru Road, they don't, they some of them would like sidewalks. Um, some folks on 32nd Street would like sidewalks as well. So I think that once this is finalized, we'll probably move on to see what we can do in the other parts of town. Um, but kind of when you look at a, the public and private partnerships that we've come up with, I was really impressed with how the stump and sidewalk program has been progressing so efficiently and rapidly on Jackson Street, just right on my own street. I was impressed how those, got, those contractors and public crew were able to work together with getting the trees cut down, getting the sidewalks fixed, getting the stumps taken out, and the brand new sidewalks all done in a very rapid period. I'm hoping that that can be a very similar and smoothless process for you, for you citizens. So. I'm looking forward to supporting this. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Jones, did you have any comments you wanted to make? I do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first of all, I, I get that many of you think this is unfair. And I'll tell you what, we thought so too. That's why we sought out the grant. That's why the city is taking responsibility for the construction and the maintenance of the retaining walls, um, because it is an extraordinary project. Um, I feel bad that you're back here again for the fourth time um, for a different reason than, than you do. Um, I think we should have done it in 2018 and this should have been all over with and you should be enjoying your new sidewalks and realizing that um, they didn't add any danger. Uh, paramount in this whole issue is public safety, the safety of the pedestrian public. Um, we hear a lot about how the kids walk a, a trail on the backside of the properties to get to school. Well, that's, that's a good thing. But it's only there because there was no other safe way to get there. Um, there was no sidewalks on this busy street. And it's a challenge for Dubuque. Dubuque has uh, Rockdale Road, Peru Road, West 32nd Street, portions of John F. Kennedy that uh, not too long ago, some of them 40, 50 years ago, I guess, were county roads, were gravel roads, and are now city streets. And they've gotten busier and busier and busier as time goes on. Um, this particular one has the, the greatest concentration of housing and folks around it, of, of residential neighborhoods and of commerce, uh, of all of them. And so it's, it's a priority. It's also the one that uh, hundreds of people have asked us to do something about. So it's time that we do something about it. I think, uh, I think city staff's done a great job of acquiring some financing to, or some, some grant dollars to ease the impact 
I'm really glad we were able to do that. You might be able to find private contractors to put the sidewalk in that will ease it even more. Um, the 3% money good for 15 years certainly takes the bite out of it. It's time to do this. We have to vote for it tonight. Um, I apologize for the hardship that some of you are going to feel. Um, we think we've fixed some of the inequities. And this is how sidewalk construction works everywhere in this city. Um, the budding landowners uh, have some responsibility to to put them there and to maintain them. I'm not sorry for that. That's the law. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, well, I'll make a few comments as well. I'll try not to repeat uh, what's already been said. But, uh, you know, I remember back uh, when I was a council member and, you know, this first came to the to the city and uh, I had not gotten any calls on on uh, sidewalks on JFK, but there was no there wasn't a connection. There wasn't the housing that is there now, the connections to the trails, uh, the uh, bike hike trail on the arterial, uh, which really uh, this is a main feeder road to that uh, arterial. And yet people can't walk to get to that bike trail on Kennedy Road without walking in the street, you know, if it's snowing or walking on people's lawns. So uh, things have changed and they've changed a lot. But as long as I've been on this council, uh, it's always been uh, citizens or groups that have come to the city and say, you know, look, look at the possibility of sidewalks in this area because you know, people are walking in the street. One that's very similar to this uh, would be the, the project on Pennsylvania Avenue, where uh, there was a lot of sidewalk missing from Rosemont to the arterial. And kids that went to Hempstead were actually walking in the snow or, or in the street around the, the uh, plow lines to get to school. Heard the same arguments, it's gonna be in my backyard, how are we ever gonna maintain it? I haven't heard anything since the sidewalks were put in about that issue. Uh, I personally have almost 100 feet on Kaufman Avenue and I live on Becker Court. So for 34 years that I've lived there, I've done the snow around, uh, the, around the block, halfway around the block to get to that uh, frontage. Today, there's a couple of younger folks who live there and many times they beat me to it. But uh, neighbors help neighbors, and I think you'll see that happening, you know, along Kennedy Road as well. Uh, there's a lot of great people that live there, and I don't see why it would be any different there than it is, uh, you know, with my neighbors on Becker Court. And, um, you know, we do have a, it was mentioned about the complete street policy that the city has. You know, it's all about sustainability, getting people out and, Mobile and uh, sidewalks are a big part of that, you know, the connectivity in this community. So uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna vote to support this. I think we've, we've uh, you know, really looked at every option, you know, to reduce the costs and, and still uh, get those sidewalks put in there uh, for the safety of the community at large. And, you know, I travel that road a lot and I do see people uh, walking in the street or walking up on top of snow piles, especially by, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, by old timers. I mean, you can see the, the uh, rut worn in the grass in the lawns along there between there and, and uh, Kaufman Avenue. So people are uh, walking there, but they just don't have the access to a sidewalk. Uh, anyone else have any comments? Okay, uh, the motion uh, was to receive and file and adopt the two resolutions. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Carry 7 0. Public hearing number two is 2021 redistricting plan for city wards and precincts. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Kavanaugh. I move. Actually, can I can I ask about this motion, please? Sure. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little confused. I just want to make sure that um, do, do they need to be made separately or can we make these motions together? Uh, the motion uh, to waive the three readings has to be separate. The other two uh, can be put together or you can do them separately. It's up to you. So uh, can I make two motions at the, at the same time here? The first motion would be first motion. to... Uh, yeah, to weigh okay. the three readings of the okay. ordinance. All right. So then um, in that case, um, I move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second, Vice Frank. 
Okay, a motion by uh, Mr. Kavanaugh, second by Mr. Sprank. Um, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Planning Services Manager Wally Wernemont recommends the City Council approval of the 2021 redistricting plan for city wards and precincts. Cities with a population over 3,500 must review all ward and precinct boundaries to determine if redistricting is needed to comply with state law. The current ward and precinct boundaries were adopted in the 2011 redistricting plan based on the 2010 census population data. These boundaries were amended as territory was annexed to the city over the last 10 years. After consultation with the Dubuque County Auditor's Office, city staff has determined that the city of Dubuque is required to file a redistricting plan with the state of Iowa. Finalized plans are due to the Secretary of State by January 3rd, 2022. If the city does not file a 2021 redistricting plan by this date, the Secretary of State will redraw the ward and precinct boundaries without city input and then assess the cost to the city. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> we are in a public hearing to consider City Council approval of the 2021 redistricting plan for city wards and precincts. Is there anyone in the chambers to address the council on this? Do we have anyone virtually to address the council? We do not have any comments on this one. Okay. No emails received. Okay, I'll bring it back to the table for any discussion. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sprank. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming Wally's on the line? Yes. Okay. Uh, question is, how will it work with the folks that technically live in the county, those extra areas? How will that work? I was a little confused by that, and maybe nobody... And maybe that's a question, a, a bigger question, so. Wally, can you respond, please? Yeah, you bet. This is Planning Services Manager Wally Wernemont. And uh, the second document that we're talking about that would be approved for resolution is that precinct agreement. And required by state law, um, when we have situations where there's portions mm -hmm. of the, uh, the precinct that lies outside of the corporate boundaries, um, we work with the Dubuque County to come with an agreement, and that's in order to uh, allow a reduced number of precincts. But then there's also situations where the legislative district boundaries have cut off portions, and they don't meet the population threshold. So those portions need to be added to existing precincts in the city in order for a cost savings, but then also to uh, help write those numbers from 50, over 50, to meet that precinct requirement. So when there are elections, city elections, individuals that reside in the portions inside the corporate limits will receive ballots to vote on those uh, you know, elections like uh, council member elections and other things. Um, when there are other elections that involve uh, county residents or statewide elections, um, the residents that reside outside the corporate limits will receive a different ballot from the residents that live inside the corporate limits. So. Um, when you go into your precinct polling place, you know, you provide your name and your address and they provide you the appropriate ballot. So we do not have individuals in the corporate limits voting on county elections and there are not residents in the county voting on city elections. Does that help answer your question, council member? Yep, that does. Thank you, Wally. Yep. Hey, anyone else have any questions? Okay, the motion is uh, to receive and file and waive the three readings of the ordinance. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Council Member Jones. Aye. Thank you. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Buell. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. That motion carries 7 0. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Kavanaugh. I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Sprank. Motion by Mr. Kavanaugh, second by Mr. Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Barber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion carries 7 0. Mr. Mayor. Okay, Mr. Kavanaugh. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Sprank. Second by Mr. Kavanaugh. Second by Mr. Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion carries 7 0. 
public hearing number three is proceedings for public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed $900,000 sewer revenue capital loan notes, interim financing, state revolving funds, planning and design loan applications. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Uh, Resnick, please. <laughs> Uh, I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Farber. Motion by Mr. Resnick, second by Ms. Farber. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Director of Finance and Budget Jennifer Larson is recommending City Council approval of the suggested proceedings for a public hearing and the issuance not to exceed $900,000 in sewer revenue capital loan notes, state revolving loan fund program. $400,000 of the proceeds will be used to fund the planning and design of the 42-inch force main stabilization project. The 42-inch force main stabilization project includes stabilizing and protecting the existing force main that runs along the Mississippi River, which carries approximately 80% of the wastewater generated in the city to the treatment facility. The improvements involve reestablishing the protective envelope around the force main and stabilizing the river shoreline to combat future erosion. $500,000 of the proceeds will be used to fund the planning and design of the Granger Creek Interceptor Sewer Improvements Project. The Granger Creek Interceptor Sewer Improvements Project includes extending sewer to serve the businesses in Tamarack Business Park, extending sewer to serve the Twin Ridge subdivision, and eliminating the existing lagoon system and upgrading the existing Granger Creek lift station to accommodate the additional flow and better serve the service area. The state revolving capital loan notes will carry a zero interest rate for up to three years and have no initiation or servicing fees. The loan may be rolled into an SRF construction loan or repaid when permanent financing is obtained. The proceedings have been prepared to show as a first step the receipt of any oral or written objections from any resident or property owner to the proposed action of the council to authorize the form of loan and disbursement agreement and issue the notes to the Iowa Finance Authority. A summary of objections received or made, if any, should be attached to the proceedings. After all objections have been received and considered, if the city council decides to enter into the agreement and issue the notes, a form of resolution follows that should be introduced and adop adopted entitled Resolution Instituting Proceedings to Take Additional Action. In the event the City Council decides to abandon the proposal, then the form of resolution included in said proceeding should not be adopted. In this event, a motion merely should be adopted to the effect that such proposal is abandoned. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider City Council approval of the suggested proceedings for a public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed $900,000 in sewer revenue capital loan notes, interim financing, state revolving loan fund program. Is there anyone in the chambers to address the council on this? Do we have any virtual input? Not on this item. No? No emails received. Okay, thank you. I'll bring it back to the table for any discussion. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion carries 7 0. Public hearing number four is proceedings for public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed $1,570,000 water revenue capital loan notes, interim financing, state revolving funds, planning and design loan applications. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sprank. I motion that we receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Farber. Motion by Mr. Sprank, second by Ms. Farber. Uh, Mike, Mike, please. Thank you. <clears throat> City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Director of Finance and Budget Jennifer Larson is recommending City Council approval of the suggested proceedings for a public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed $1,570,000 in water revenue capital loan notes, state revolving loan fund program, the proceeds of which will be used to pay planning and design costs for Weber Property Water Distribution System Improvements Project. The Weber Property Water Distribution System Improvements Project includes water main installation, a distribution system pumping facility, and a water storage facility. The state revolving capital loan notes will carry a 0% interest rate for up to three years and have no initiation or servicing fees. 
The loan may be rolled into an SRF construction loan or repaid when permanent financing is obtained. The proceedings have been prepared to show as a first step the receipt of any oral or written objections from any resident or property owner to the proposed action of the council to authorize the form of loan and disbursement agreement and issue the notes to the Iowa Finance Authority. A summary of objections received or made, if any, should be attached to the proceedings. After all objections have been received and considered, if the City Council decides to enter into the agreement and issue the notes, a form of resolution follows it should be introduced and adopted entitled Resolution Instituting Proceedings to Take Additional Action. In the event the City Council decides to abandon the proposal and the form of resolution included in said proceedings should not be adopted. In this event, a motion merely be adopted to the effect that such proposal is abandoned. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> we are in a public hearing to consider City Council approval of the suggested proceedings for a public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed $1,570,000 in water revenue capital loan notes, interim financing, state revolving loan fund program, the proceeds of which will be used to pay planning and design costs for Weber property water distribution system improvements project. Is there anyone in the chambers to address us on this? Seeing none, do we have any virtual input? Not on this one. Okay. No emails received. Okay, I'll bring it back to the table for any discussion. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. Yes, thank you. And um, so, first of all, I, I have a question about the interim or final funding. I think uh, the note, uh, the city manager explanation was very, uh, very well written. And even so, it's, it's confusing uh, to, to see, you know, it's complicated what's Here, going yes. on. So my question, does either the interim or final funding uh, ding us on our debt reduction policy, or is that separate because it's SRF? <clears throat> so uh, when the city uh, uses SRF to borrow money, so it's a federal program administered through the state, and um, we're allowed to use it on projects like this, water and sewer projects, um, it does not count against our statutory debt limit. So you'll remember that the city of Dubuque only uses 45% of our statutory debt limit. So we have tremendous uh, debt capacity if there were to be an emergency or something in our community. Um, but these loans do not count against our statutory debt limit. However, the council also has a policy that every year we're allowed to recommend issuing debt, but the council would like us to retire more debt each year than is issued. This does count against that. And we are this year, uh, as we have been since 2015, every year when the council adopted that policy, uh, with these borrowings still able to meet the council's directive to not issue more debt than we retire this year. Um, I, I will say there will be some interesting challenges coming up in the next couple of years related to that, but they're good challenges. Uh, and the reason is because uh, of the uh, $1.1 trillion infrastructure bill passed by the federal government. There's going to be a tremendous amount of new dollars flowing into uh, states, counties, and cities uh, to fix infrastructure. Um, but some of that money is going to be competitive grants and not just a block grant where you're assured you're going to get a certain amount. And some of it is through the SRF borrowing program. For instance, the state of Iowa uh, will receive $300 million in new money for this program uh, over the next five years to, to lend out to cities and counties to do these kinds of projects. That's in addition to the allocation they already get annually. So that's $300 million in additional dollars. Um, however, we're being told, even though the final rules have not been written yet, that uh, those loans are going to come with a 49% forgivable component. And so uh, as we look at doing these projects that now we're doing the design for and the planning for, and then we're gonna be ready to actually construct the projects and borrow the money to do those projects, hopefully by then, and we believe it will, by March we're, we're being assured all these rules will be put into place. Uh, those new rules will exist and the forgiveness components will exist and so that's when the council will have to look at these major projects that are needed to be done in our community to 
keep our infrastructure current, which it's, uh, we, you know, we struggle with now as the oldest city in the state of Iowa, um, is how do we, how does that reflect against the city council policy of, do you issue more debt? Uh, I'm sorry, do you retire more debt each year than you issue? So let me get an example. Let's say we had a $10 million project and if we were to issue $10 million worth of debt, that would put you over your policy. But 50% of that, 49%, is forgivable. It's, it, it's still called, it's called a forgivable loan. So it's not called a grant. So it's still called a loan, but it's forgivable. And so the policy will, uh, council will have to determine, well, does that forgivable component count against that policy? Um, I can tell you that I'm probably gonna advocate for it doesn't because we don't have to pay it back. Um, but uh, the council will have to make that decision. And I apologize for the long-winded answer. I hope I answered your original question. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, and I thought you, you talked about, again, I thought the uh, the memo was well-written, but it's a, it's a tricky subject and it was, uh, so I appreciate the, uh, the further explanation. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any other comments, questions? Okay, the motion is to receive and file and adopt the two resolutions. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. The motion carries 7 0. We will move on to public input. At this time, anyone partici participating in the meeting may address the city council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the city council. For all in-person attendees, please prepare to approach the podium and state your name and address when the mayor asks if there is any public input. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the city council can take no formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to the action items on the agenda. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, is there anyone in the chambers to address the council? Good evening. Good evening. Mayor Bill, uh, distinguished council, Mike, uh, <coughs> city clerk. Uh, I'd just like to address uh, Roy. I want to personally thank you uh, for all the proclamations you've signed and approved for the Mike and the Eyes of the Futures Committee and uh, all your uh, support for the Eyes of the Future and our projects and I deeply appreciate it. And, and lastly, I would like to personally thank you for the growth and development of this community. You've been impeccable and like a, like a laser how you've concentrated to make this city an all-American city and be the best it can be. But your dedication and commitment has been unbelievable because commitment is the foundation of personal integrity. Commitment challenges to set a goal and to support it with a promise. And that's what you've done, Roy. You've been wonderful what you've done for this community. And we deeply appreciate all citizens of Buke should be so greatly appreciative of you. And this is one person that's very appreciative of you, and thank you so much, and God bless you and Deb and, uh, and your endeavors in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you God very bless much. You. Thank you. Anyone else to address the council? Uh, do we have any virtual input? We do not. I would just like to acknowledge receiving um, one uh, public input item. Sarah Odding of 940 Southern Avenue provided public input regarding action item number two, expressing support for the project and providing input on the process of installation and pricing. That input has been forwarded to the city council. Okay, thank you. Amy. We will move on to action items. Action item number one is Greater Dubuque Development Corporation quarterly update. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber. 
Mr. Mayor, <laughs> I move that we receive and file and hear the presentation. Second by Roussel. Okay, motion by Ms. Farber, second by Ms. Roussel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dickinson. Good evening, uh, Mayor Buell, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the council, city manager Mike Van Milligan, most excellent city staff. Uh, my name is Rick Dickinson, and I have the pleasure of uh, serving as the president of Greater Dubuque Development Corporation, and I reside at uh, 205 Hill Street uh, in Dubuque. But before I begin, and I'll explain why I'm here this evening, I too would like to take a point of personal privilege, if I may, and acknowledge, as our previous speaker did, um, uh, the connection and the appreciation I have uh, for Mayor Buell. Uh, I started in this position uh, nearly 26 years ago, which happens to be the same span of time that the mayor has served as both uh, council member and mayor. And in that time, it has been an honor and a privilege to serve and work with you. And beginning in January, uh, uh, you won't have to deal with me anymore. I hope it's an opportunity for you to continue to do that because I consider you, and I believe it is a blessing to have you as a friend for the rest of my life. So thank you for all you've done for this community. Thank you, Rick. I'm here today um, as part of the agreement that Greater Dubuque Development Corporation has with the city of Dubuque to provide a quarterly update on our activities uh, in addition to this report, we provide an annual audit uh, to the city. I'm pleased to state that uh, this is the 26th consecutive audit with no findings that we'll be supplying the city in December uh, before the end of this fiscal year, an audit conducted by uh, Han Camp Kruger. Um, and as part of that report, um, I am going to discuss with you uh, the issues of the day, what's happened the last three months. But before I do that, I'd like to get into this slide that's in front of you to talk about that just a bit. Uh, oftentimes in Dubuque, for us to understand where we're at today and where we're going tomorrow, uh, we take a look in the past and we talk oftentimes about a time in our history where it is said that somebody had a t-shirt that said the last one out of Dubuque, turn out the lights. And oftentimes, especially for those of us that have were not here in Dubuque at the time, we think that that's a snapshot in time. That, oh, that must have been a bad year. And in fact, in January of 1982, we did have the highest unemployment in the United States at approximately 23%. But what this chart shows you is that it was much more than a point in time. It was a 37-year journey of stagnation that didn't begin in 1981. It actually began in 1976 as you see here. From 1976 until 1990, when this community hit absolute rock bottom for its regional economy, we lost nearly 10% of our population. 9,238 of our folks left this community because of reductions in the number of jobs. And too many families had to sit down at that kitchen table in the morning and admit that there is nothing for us here, and they had to leave. It didn't stop in 1990. We began that slow crawl out of the abyss that took 23 years to get back to where we were in 1976 population levels, 37 years of stagnation. But since, 19, since 2013, we have progressed. We've shown population growth of 3.4%, 3,276 folks have joined us here in Dubuque County with more to come. We're beginning a campaign for the next five year financing of the efforts of Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. And I'll never forget one conversation I had with an investor when they looked me in the eye after the ask and said, when is economic development going to be developed? When are we finished? And my answer was, when we give up. When we wish not to grow any further, 
and we realize what happened in the last 37 years could easily happen again. And if we continue, if we continue that climb, we will never have to again sit down at that breakfast table and say there's nothing for us here because everyone can be great in the greater Dubuque area. I want to talk to you about the activities of the last quarter. This is a report we provide to the mayor, the council, and the citizens uh, every three months. And I'm going to quickly go down the list because there's some even better news as soon as I step down from the podium. In the last three months, we announced that Zero Zone, a Wisconsin company, has uh, reloc expanded their operation to Dubuque County and Dyersville with 50 new employees. In the last three months, the city announced its intent and with our full support and encouragement, 156 acres, which is the next stage of development for the greater Dubuque area. Thank you, Mayor and Council and City Manager and your staff for that commitment. Um, within the last three months, the Dubuque Metropolitan Solid Waste Agency uh, launched the biogas facility. That is a phenomenal event. Uh, it will uh, uh, Reduce CO2 equivalent to over 2,700 homes a year. An amazing feat. And it will generate over $90,000 of revenue for the region. So cleaner air, more revenue, an example for being a sustainable community. And I'd like to thank the Dubuque Power Products LLC for their investment in that project. And Black Hills Energy as our partner in accepting that biogas into their system. And a member of our team, David Lyons, so this is the second biogas facility he's worked with the city on, first one being the Water Resource Recovery Center. And I should mention the International Economic Development Council honored Greater Dubuque Development with the Bronze Award for Economic Development Organization of the Year in 2021. Uh, next, we have a, a guest who's gonna make an announcement also with Dave Lyons from our office uh, dealing with broadband expansion. But before we go there, I'd be glad to answer any questions that the mayor, council, or city manager and staff might have. Anyone have any questions for Rick? <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, Rick, for that, uh, that update and for your comments. <laughs> it's, it's been a pleasure working with you and Michael both. You both have done so much in this community. It's, it's incredible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the motion uh, is to receive and file. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. And carry 7 0. Action item number two is I'm on communications, fiber to the home build out presentation. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Sprank? I motion that we receive and file and listen to the presentation. Second by Resnick. Motion by Mr. Sprank, second by Mr. Resnick. David, please. Mayor and Council, it's great to see you again. David Lyons, Sustainability Innovation Consultant with Greater Dubuque Development Corporation, uh, 900 Jackson Street. Um, I'm here just for a couple of minutes of background for what Chris and our guest are gonna discuss, and that is the broadband initiative, which began in 2016 when our analysis said that uh, we were average, uh, but we were not where we needed to be on connectivity if we were gonna compete with the folks we've started to compete with now, which is Madison, Minneapolis, Denver. Um, so we went to work, we looked at the options, and as you'll remember, I came back with that odd little comment that said we're too big for the small city approach and too small for the big city approach, which meant uh, we weren't a small city that could just build it ourselves. We were too big, growing too fast, and this is not the topography that you want to build in. Um, but we were also too small for the big city approach of being able to take a dense population and make them available to the market to compete. So we together set out on a public-private partnership path where what we would do is we would entertain collaboration with the private sector, and together we would, A, reduce the costs by using city assets and jointly uh, sharing those assets with the private sector, um, B, by changing all of our administrative processes so it is actually faster to market in Dubuque than it is anywhere else, and third, to be able to deliver on the equity promise that the broadband is about 
everyone being having access, no matter where they live, how much money they make, or what they do for a living. So we began to work, and as you saw over the last number of years, pretty successful. Uh, without a lot of increased budgetary costs from the city, we have quintupled the amount of fiber available for use and collaboration. And we've gone from two to 10 carriers who are actively investing in the community. And you're kind of seeing more and more licensing agreements every time that you come to your council. All good, uh, they all expand capacity and offset some of the costs the city's had in providing the infrastructure. Um, so with that success, we've turned to talking about really how do we drive it deeper and deeper. And we do that in two ways. We do that by addressing affordability and equity. So we drive it deep relationships with our citizens. And we do it by increasing the public-private partnerships and allowing the private partners to access more and more of the opportunities that are in Dubuque for connectivity. I'm going to turn it over to Chris. She's going to talk a little bit and then introduce our guest. Thanks, Dave, and good evening, Council and Mayor. I'm Chris Coleman. I'm the Information Services Manager for the City of Dubuque. And I think tonight is really, um, in my 39-year career, it, I, and I, by the way, I was here in 1982. That's when I started with the city. So I know the story that Rick told very well. And much like um, economic development is never done, uh, information technology, including broadband, is never done. And I, I think IMON plays a critical role in that public-private partnership that um, David talked about in that really part of our broadband strategy over the last few years has been focused on um, business, it's been focused on anchor institutions, it's been focused on public sector. And I think this evening we, we hear a story about now we're gonna be shifting to a, um, a resident focused for the next few years from IMON. And I think they, IMON plays this critical role not only in the public-private partnerships but as well as part of our overall broadband strategy for the city of Dubuque with residents, business, public sector, anchor institutions in that it's not just an investment in the infrastructure, but it's also part of a strategy that I like to talk about connecting the dots. It's about a partnership with the city on the, the joint builds that we come to you with. It's about leveraging an investment we've made in the city's fiber optic and conduit assets that say they're not laying idle for some potential future capacity that we might have, but it's a public-private partnership that really creates a return on investment but probably most of all creates a return on service with areas that are not only provided high speed uh, connectivity, but as you'll hear tonight about having that redundant internet services that's so important for high availability and particularly for those that, that most need it um, for their work, for their banking, for their health care, for everything that we've seen a shift to online that's happened um, in terms of, of COVID and, and well beyond. So it's my pleasure this evening to introduce President and CEO of IMON Communications, Patrice Carroll, who will talk about IMON's Dubuque expansion coming up over the next few years. Thank you, Chris. Oh, thank you, Chris and Dave. Um, and thank you, Mike, for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm on communications. Um, was started in 2007 as a startup. Um, we bought some fiber assets um, from McLeod USA in Cedar Rapids only. Um, and what we thought we could do um, is build a different kind of communications company, one that was very focused on local, um, very focused on the communities, at that time just Cedar Rapids, um, that we would serve, and that we were about connecting people, okay? Um, our objective is um, making connections one person at a time. And to do that, it means that we not only have to provide the technology um, and the infrastructure to enable people to, to connect as we do today digitally, but we also needed to be able to connect with our customers in a very personal way as individuals and with our community. So that when we come to a community, and we, we don't operate in many communities, 
um, in eastern Iowa, but we come to be your local provider, okay? And we come committed to your communities. Um, like I said, we've almost been in business 15 years in March. We'll have been in business 15 years. And we've survived all, survived all the weather that Iowa could, Iowa could throw at us. Um, and we're very excited about accelerating the pace in which we built. And that's what really what I'm here to talk um, to you today. Um, it was interesting for me to see the chart um, that, that you presented. Um, I first came to do, I live in Iowa City. Um, I'm, I'm not a native Iowan. I moved here um, in 88. My husband's a professor at the university and I followed him. Um, my, the first time I visited Dubuque was in 1990. Um, and I think I was only in Dubuque one other time for a soccer game with my kids. And um, so I really was introduced to Dubuque at your low. Um, in 2000, late 2016 or early 2017, um, Dave Lyons found his way to my desk, or my office <laughs> in Cedar Rapids. Um, with a proposition. At that time, I'm on operated in Cedar Rapids, Marion and Hiawatha, and in Iowa City, but we weren't completely built out anywhere. Um, and here was Dave Lyons saying, have I got a proposition for you. Um, Dubuque could have been at the other end of the country because we had no connectivity. Um, and my image of Dubuque was of 1990. So after um, Dave and I had had a few conversations, um, I told my husband, I need to go visit Dubuque. We're not gonna move I'm on to any community that I don't feel good about. We need to go visit. My husband and I spent three different weekends up here, me exploring Dubuque and getting a sense for the community. And I have to say how incredibly impressed I was, how far Dubuque has come since my first visits in the 1990s. So my hat is off to you and how, extraordinary, how much extraordinary progress Dubuque has made since that time. Okay, so I'm on in Dubuque. Like I said, oh, I'm in charge, aren't I? Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, we got this made. All right, um, as I mentioned, Dave approached me in <clears throat> early 2017, and at that time, we had no connectivity to Dubuque, so we couldn't have provided service right away if we had wanted to. Um, I did the analysis. Um, the AT&T conduit um, was very intriguing, um, as was the ability to lease conduit from the city and the possibility of a partnership. Um, one of IMON's trademarks is our ability to partner. And we believe that's part of our secret sauce. We partner very closely with the governments and all the communities we serve, but we also partner with the utility companies and the um, locate companies and all the, the company or <laughs> all the partners that you need to be able to successfully build anywhere. Um, once we determined that uh, yes, there was a way um, to actually connect Dubuque back to our main, um, we call it a head end, but it's where all the services actually are provided from. Um, we hired Bernard Ducek, um, dedicated to getting Dubuque connected. In November of 2017, we lit the northern route. Now, I'm an engineer. Okay, and you know, the price a company pays for having an engineer as a CEO is, in this business is there has to be redundancy um, because things break in telecommunications. Um, and truth be told, things break every day. I mean, your network's outside, you're dealing with everything from ants who can bring your network down to derechos, and so that redundancy is incredibly important. In March of 2018, um, we made the second connection. 
Um, and although we did bring up a customer early in 2018 before we had the redundancy, um, we, we didn't sell actively until we had that redundancy in place. Dave helped us um, get a lease um, for the old AT&T building that's owned by the Dubuque Museum of Art, um, which is our core location. And all of our services come through that core location. Okay, so now we have this redundant ring. Um, I, I'm not even gonna share with you how many times one or the other end side of it has gone down, but Dubuque services have not gone down. Um, we've invested to date about $5 million in Dubuque. Okay, within the city there are 86 miles of fiber that we have laid. We currently pass 570 business addresses, and this year, in fourth quarter, for the first time, we built an, a residential neighborhood. Um, it's located near Loris College, and we brought up 482 re, um, addresses. Okay, and in December, we started selling into those addresses. Okay, the, on this map, the pink indicates the areas that we have network completely um, built out. The yellow is um, the cit uh, city limits or the city geography. Currently, our residential offering is all fiber to the home. Everything we do is fiber based. We offer a 100 um, megabit service up to a gig. So, you know, we are very, you know, when you support the community, it's not about selling the biggest package, okay? It's about marrying the services that we provide with what the customer actually needs, okay? So customers can buy a gig and a bet service. To be honest, few residential customers really need it. Um, I bought it because I want to test it three or four times a day to make sure we're providing the real service. But 100 meg of fiber, um, fiber is a service that's not shared. Um, when you're getting 100 meg a bit of service, you're getting 100 meg of service. It's, it's always there. Um, and you know, that's usually more than enough for any residential service. But there are options. We are also a CLEC. Um, we provide phone service. Um, it is a declining um, product line. People don't have as many landlines. But the pandemic has proven to us that there is a need, um, as we saw an increased, increased take, take rate on our um, phone service. Um, people like that have security. If their cell phone went dead, they could still connect with a phone line. And um, if you were watching, you'll notice that we, um, in the last two months, applied for a um, cable franchise, through, and we're granted one for the city of Dubuque through the state of Iowa's program. We'll be launching um, our video service in Dubuque, Dubuque um, in first quarter. It's in testing right now. Um, I'm hopeful to have the service installed at my house as a beta tester. Um, but you can expect that service to be available in Dubuque first quarter along with the broadband. Currently of the, those um, 400 and some residential service um, addresses that we brought up in fourth quarter, um, 112 of them are, are currently IMON customers. The business side, um, which we've been offering, as I mentioned, since 2018, we've been offering business services. It's, again, fiber to the premise. And again, we mar marry our service with the customer actually needs. In Dubuque, there are customers that need 10 gig a bit service. And so we provide 10 gig a bit service. But there's also many small customers that 20 meg gets the job done. And so that's what we provide. We provide a whole suite of sophisticated telecommunications products. Um, on the business side that enables us to s provide services for some of your very largest businesses um, down to the little ones, okay? We do hosted services, trunking, 
um, services, which is just a point-to-point -point type connection. We also, in this day and age, provide DDoS protection because denial of service attacks are a real thing, and we find our corporate customers oftentimes want that service. And again, starting first quarter, we'll be offering vid video services. Um, currently, we, have, we serve 233 businesses um, in Dubuque and growing every day. Um, we have a new director of Dubuque with us, um, Rick Thompson. Um, has has joined um, I'm on has relocated here and is fully dedicated um, to making I'm I'm on be Dubuque's local company. Um, the I'm the I'm on team today includes two business development executives. Or um, yeah, and four full time construction. Um, tax and installation team. So we, ha we have about seven people that are based in Dubuque and, um, and live in this area. And then we augment um, from our other communities. Um, when we're doing a big construction here, like the residential area fourth quarter, you know, I'm on crew came in um, to augment um, the team that was here. Um, we really function as one community, so, um, or one company across eastern Iowa, um, and so we, we go where, wherever the work it is to be done. In 2002, we'll start building our residential team. Um, we'll hire two more residential sales representatives, um, plus installation um, and service techs. Um, there's a ratio between how many customers we have to how many service texts we need, and that will continue to grow. Um, what's not on there, I realize, is that we'll also be putting two customer service, residential customer service people in Dubuque. Um, we really believe that part of our brand is about being able to respond immediately, um, and we take that very seriously. And so in our downtown office, we'll um, have two residential service people. And you know, when you expand, you need more room. <laughs> we have lots of equipment and materials. And so um, we opened an, um, a warehouse um, on Hughes Court this year. Um, we leased space there um, and have it filled with construction materials. And we'll be hiring a warehouse a warehouse manager um, to manage that location sometime next year. Um, as I indicated, you know, our main administrative offices is, are on Main Street. Um, that will become primarily a residential um, customer care location. Um, we have warehouse at Use Court. Um, our main hub is the old AT&T building on 8th Street, and we've um, this year built two additional hubs to get us ready for the full residential expansion. As I, I said, um, IMON is a very community-oriented community company, um, and so we don't just come in to provide services. You know, we support the nonprofits that are important to this community. Um, and we belong to the chamber, and um, we support the organizations in this company. Um, this week, we sponsored the teddy bear um, toss um, at the ice arena um, at the, during the hockey game. Um, every year we do, um, we sponsor either a family or an organization at Christmas time. Um, in Dubuque, we've sponsored the Hills and Dales residents that don't go home for Christmas to ensure their Christmas is special. And again, this is a company-wide organization, uh, or company-wide commitment that we have done since the first day is to sponsor a family or, in this case, um, Hills and Dales um, as part of our Christmas projects. We have 158 employees today and they all do the shopping and we have a big wrapping day <laughs> and <laughs> deliver the gifts. Um, I'm on provides free Wi-Fi 
in all the communities that we serve. In Dubuque thus far, we have um, free Wi-Fi in the B Branch Creek Gateway area, Five Flags area, um, the Mystic Community Ice Center area, and the parking lots downtown. Um, the parking areas are, that's new to the, uh, to the pandemic. Um, because the public locations where um, people with less resources typically went to get Wi-Fi were closed um, due to the pandemic. In all our communities, we put up Wi-Fi in parking lots so they could drive to that la um, lo locations and still have access to the, the broadband that everybody needs today. Our partnership with Dubuque, Today we lease um, 21.3 miles. You can tell I'm an engineer, right? There's got to be a decimal point involved. <laughs> um, miles of duct work from the city of Dubuque. And as Dave said, Dubuque's tough topography. <laughs> I mean, um, so we're grateful um, to not have to go through rock any time that we don't have to. The city and I'm on have partnered on almost 50 or, um, joint builds throughout the metro um, so that when we're building, we build for conduit. When the city's got projects going, we say, hey, can we build, um, be involved in those as well? And so this has been very beneficial for us, and I hope to be feels the same way. One of our biggest partnerships, and Chris, um, can really attest to this because hours and hours of work have been spent by the city of Dubuque and I'm on employees putting together an application for an NTIA grant. Um, this is part of the um, Federal Appropriations Act from 2000, yeah, from this year, 2021, at the beginning of, year, of the year, made funds available for broadband grant grants administered by the T. Um, National Telephone and Information Association. Um, the grant that we put together, um, and, and Chris had amazing data that helped so much, um, but is for the, that B branch area. And you, know, you can see where the, the, um, the fiber will go and where it's laid out. The project is a $6.8 million project. Um, the grant application is for $5.1 million. IMON is committed to invest 25% or $1.7 million um, of our own money to this project. The project will, co um, will um, cover or pass um, 4,678 addresses in this area. Um, there, are, yeah, there are 32 130 unique locations. So some of those are MDUs, so it really should say locations instead of addresses. Um, it will cover f um, 493 businesses and for <clears throat> um, 4,100 or 4,200 of those will be residential addresses. We know we're still in the running because as late as last week, we were still getting questions about it, um, so keep your fingers crossed. We're hoping in for good news in January. In 2000, I'm gonna, yeah, in 2022, I'm actually gonna, yeah, here we go. Well, in 2022, um, we will, expand our network to cover the green area, the shaded green area. On, um, yeah. That area will take about a $4 million expansion. Um, the design is nearly complete um, for that area. Um, we expect actually to be ready to start construction in late spring. Um, materials have been a challenge. Um, supply chain is across the news in every industry, um, ours as well. Um, we did realize that early in the year of 2021, and so we made a mass order in uh, actually last June, um, and we expect to start getting those materials sometime in the spring. 
Um, so you can expect to see us in late spring um, constru constructing the area in green. Um, 2023, um, some of this could start late 2022, um, the gold color. And you will see the same area, the grant area. So we're really hopeful um, to get that grant money. If we get it, it will accelerate that portion of the build. If we don't get it, we will still build that area. It just will be later in 2003. Okay, um, the 2003 makes up about an $8 million project um, to bring all those together. And then lastly, um, in 2004, we will, com or 2004, 2024, we will um, have completed all of Dubuque. All of this area is built in rings. And to give you, and it, it's more expensive doing it that way. We could take shortcuts. Um, but to give you an example of the, um, the importance and, and why we do that, I'm sure many of you heard Cedar Rapids experienced a derecho um, in August last year. It leveled our network in Cedar Rapids. It took down every single one of our customers, and that's that's our, you know, where we've been the longest. So that's where we had the largest population. Um, it also took down one route to Dubuque, but not a single customer in Dubuque was aware that Cedar Rapids was in disarray. And that's the value of building a ringed network, is that our remote locations um, and our our municipal partners throughout Eastern Iowa had no disruption in service whatsoever, even though every customer we had in Cedar Rapids was down. Um, so we're very honored um, to be partnering with the city of Dubuque. Um, and you know, we are, we are very committed to not only bring the service, but to bring a high quality network and a lot of personal touches um, to this great community. Any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Patrice, for that presentation. I'm, I'm excited about it, and I don't have to do anything but now but sit back and, and watch things happen. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone have any questions for Patrice? Yeah, Patrice, um, I'm over here. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> so ahead. I um, very much applaud the effort that is going on with the infrastructure build out. I have a 20 year telecom background myself and have built um, international networks actually for AT&T and Verizon. And so I, I very much appreciate all of the redundancy and the um, a fiber conduit uh, and the layout and all of the build out that's going on. I do have one question. Is there any other um, redundancy being built in that is either cloud-based or other-based? Um, you know that what I didn't put in is our entire network. Okay. okay. Um, we have on um, several rings throughout eastern Iowa. They go as far as Debu or Des Moines mm -hmm. um, through the, to the Mississippi River coming down. Um, there are countless places where we have redundancy. Um, we have two data centers. One sits in Cedar Rapids, one sits in Iowa City. They're about 45 miles apart. Um, so our, our switching platform has redundancy. It actually has triple because we also are in one neck in Cedar Falls um, where we have um, redundant switching area there. We get our broadband service, um, our connection to the World Wide Web. We get it in Dubuque and in Minneapolis. We actually own a fiber route to Minneapolis, mm -hmm. and then we lease two fiber routes into um, Chicago. But they are geographically diverse. Um, so we have three geographically diverse routes that provide broadband um, into, into the network. Okay. Um, we also put caching in our network so that if customers are using like Netflix or Akamai for updates to games and 
various things mm -hmm. on it act, um, our interconnection in these caching units enable our customers mm -hmm. to get their updates by just transversing our network and not having to go into the public network. And as you know, the public network is a best efforts sure. network, right? We can only control to the edge. Um, but we've built um, peering relationships in Chicago and in Minneapolis that enable us to ensure um, the fastest connections to the world in the fewest number, they're called hops, right. between various right. um, places as you, depending on where um, you're searching on the internet. Right. What? And then one last question, any data centers that you will be uh, hosting <laughs> for? I'm sorry? I said, will you have any data centers or cloud hosting areas that the businesses can? Um, yes. Supply, yeah. Um, yes, in our Iowa City um, data center, um, there you we are some? looking to okay. to provide services primarily to our business customers right, that's what I and our partners. That. Um, right. We're a broadband infrastructure company. We're not a data center not company, but um, I ran across an amazing data center. Um, actually, what I ran across was an amazing run of conduit and the company that owned the conduit was wanting to get rid of the da data center. So I always say, well, I bought this wonderful conduit and they threw in a data center. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, there is space available there um, and we encourage our, our partners to work with us. Right, and I have a small business, so that's why I was asking, because that might be a future. That'd be great. Yeah, so I'd be very you. happy to, yeah, I'd thank you. very happy to talk to you. Um, we are not perfect. Networks are never perfect, and that's why that um, customer service and responsiveness and ensuring we have people in our communities that can respond quickly on um, most things that can be solved very quickly, and hopefully I never deal with a windstorm. I've got flood chick ticked off, and I've got windstorm ticked off, and I think I've got an ice storm ticked off. So I'm, I'm working my way through natural disasters. And wow. Hope we don't get a hurricane. Yeah. Anyone oh. else? Yeah, Mr. Any Frank? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, actually, yeah, more sorry, questions. Okay. Uh, a couple questions quick. Uh, first of all, thank you for what you guys are doing. Um, the North End, for sure, would be most appreciative of when we can get some solid, good fiber, as well as the Point associate, the Point neighborhood. Um, we've, we've got horrific internet speeds up there, so I'm very excited to see that you're, you're able to cut it down from what was originally thought of seven years down to this time frame. So fingers crossed for you. Um, uh, could you walk me through what like uh, what uh, how you guys approach citizens for like because will the fiber go along their sidewalks or how would that work exactly or, or okay well each each neighborhood is designed se separately okay and each neighborhood has its own requirements our preference is to use poles okay wherever the in, especially in Dubuque um, but <laughs> wherever there's poles um, that's our preference <clears throat> um, when we're designing um, underground network. You know, we look at easement. Um, if there's a rear easement, um, that works best for us because you can get, you know, kind of two addresses on either side of that rear easement. Um, otherwise, we'll come down the front. Um, again, working with um, usually the city easement. Um, occasionally, we'll have to uh, um, lease a private easement. Um, but every neighborhood's unique, um, and and so we design for the individual neighborhoods. In terms of our go-to-market um, strategy, um, we use traditional methods like, uh, you know, direct mail and that sort of thing. But really, what we do is we approach it as communication. We'll start communicating with the neighborhood between four and six months before we actually start construction. So that the neighborhood has gotten a letter from us, has gotten a, per, um, a postcard from us saying, hey, we're coming, you know, people from I'm on are gonna be wearing I'm on shirts, they'll all have IDs, you know, don't be concerned. Um, you know, here's what you can expect from us. Um, 
And we, we do all this before we even start talking about an offer. Um, the last thing we do is the construction crew will actually hang a doorknob or door hanger and it will give them all the important phone numbers to call if they have any concerns. Um, people take a lot of pride in their property, um, which they should, and it's pretty intimidating to have somebody boring, you know, through your backyard. Um, and so we work closely with um, the residents and ensure that, you know, where we have dug up, um, because you have to come up <laughs> to connect, um, that, you know, we restore it um, with um, the residents in mind. Um, oftentimes we'll buy bushes to help hide the pedestals or, but we'll work with the community. Um, we also use a lot of grassroots. Um, we brought up a neighborhood in Iowa City. The demographics told us there were children in the neighborhood. We brought it up in the beginning of October. And so how we approached that neighborhood is we went in with trick-or-treat bags um, and you know, hung those on the doorknob you know, and encouraged um, them to be used as trick-or-treat bags, but you know, here is some information on I'm on. We do neighborhood events. We will go to neighborhood parties. Um, and you know, we'll do customer appreciation events in the community. We'll do, um, we took a bunch of customers to the hockey game the other day. And because that's what neighbors do. Um, and so we're always looking for a creative way um, to kind of get our, our word out. I got okay. one more quick question. Are sure. you looking for more subcontractors to help you out with all this fiber that you have to install? Or uh, We definitely use contractors. Okay. On this accelerated plan, which Dubuque will benefit from, um, is a departure. I mean, traditionally, we design our own networks, and we do most of the construction ourselves. But to accelerate your pace, um, you have to have help. And actually, the derecho taught us that there were some very good contractors available. And um, my team took a deep breath and said, all right, maybe there is someone who could do work as well as we do. And, <laughs> um, but that's what's facilitating our ability to move faster, um, is the use of some good partners. Um, we've really tested them um, this year. The last probably five months of this year, we've tried an accelerated project to <laughs> test out our ability and to do some updates in our playbook so that we're really ready to hit the road running in 2022. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Anyone else have any last questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, All Patrice. Right. David, did you Thank have you. something else to? No, just a, just a couple quick items very quickly. Um, when we talk about data center, yes, it is on a work plan. Yes, we have spoken with Iman. We have also spoken with several other entities and we're spoken with the, speaking with the colleges and the nonprofits to share all that capacity Good. at several places in Dubuque. So we'll be there soon. Um, on redundancy, um, one of the biggest problems we had on additional redundancy was the river. Uh, it is a huge barrier and nobody for some reason wants to drill under the river and deal with all those issues. Thanks to what you've done, we now have conduit available on both bridges. So now we can go in two new directions and have that availability and the city controls that. On uh, the communication process, uh, earlier on uh, the city council had said they were very concerned that people know what's happening in their neighborhood. So the process that's set in place, they must communicate before they get there. They have to put up signs when they're there. Their folks have to be completely identifiable, and it has to go down to a final thing, which is the door hangers. So a very professional approach, and we'll do that with every carrier that does this. Um, last item, we were gonna give you a quick update on the equity activity, but we're gonna hold that because it's, it's getting late. Just let you know that uh, when we talked to you last time about the uh, emergency broadband benefit program where we can get more Dubuquers connected, 184 so far. It's very good so far. So if you think about that, that's $50 of savings a month a person. That adds up pretty fast. So thank you all very much.
Great. Thank you, David. Thanks you again, Patrice. Uh, okay, the motion is to receive and file. Uh, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? <clears throat> Aye. Barber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion carries 7 0. Action item number three is filling a vacancy in the office of fourth ward city council member. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Resnick? I move that we receive and file and uh, discuss. Second by Farber. Motion by Mr. Resnick, second by Ms. Farber. Okay, I'll open up for discussion. <laughs> well, you have Go ahead and start, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to having this discussion, actually, just to see where everybody's, where everybody's sitting on this. You know, I've, um, a lot of people have been asking, you know, what are we going to do uh, about the, the, the fourth ward seat? And um, I've also gotten a lot of different opinions about what that should be. Um, as I think about it, where I'm currently, um, where, I, where I currently stand on it, I think, is, you know, in looking at all the, the data we have. And by the way, I want to thank um, the city attorney, Brumwell, and... Um, uh, all the city staff for being able to provide us with all this information. This was this was very very helpful, um, especially um, uh, City Clerk Adrian Breitfelder as well, uh, who I know helped on this memo that we got here. There's a lot of detail that's helping us to make this decision and figure out you know what is the best route. When we look at this historically, you know I was looking at the other times that a seat became vacant, and one of the things that struck me was the length of time that was in that, and something that. Um, I'll just, I'll get straight to it. I, I really think that a special election makes the most sense in this case based on the length of time that we're looking at. Um, it's a two year, it's two years left in the term. A person, if we were to have a special election early in the year, would be able to serve out most of the rest of that term. Um, the voters in the fourth ward would get an opportunity to, to weigh in and be able to um, make a decision on this. And based on what is, likely going to happen next year anyway, and based on the state law that's going to require us to have a special election when we have another election, there's a good chance that's gonna happen. So we'd be having an election anyway later in the year. So that's kind of where I'm sitting on this at this point, um, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody else is thinking as we, as we talk about this. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Okay, so um, case and comment is I am the last person to have uh, gone through this experience. And it started in July, it continued in February, and then it terminated with my election, obviously, in March. And then a few months later, I was up for re-election. So within eight months, I was being elected, or up for re-election and election for um, three campaigns. So I also support a special election. I think it would offer a shorter period of time I think it would be inevitable if we did an appointment, there probably would be petitions for um, an, a special election anyway, which was in my case. Um, and I just really think that it would save us time and energy uh, and funding just to do it once and move forward that way. Okay. Yes, Mr. Sell. Thank you. Um, I I'm in agreement that with two full years left in the term, I think it's would be good to let the voters decide who should fill that seat and give them the opportunity to select someone to represent them. Ms. Frank. So um, I guess I have a question, just double checking. And Krenna, on, in your memo that you gave on page five, the second paragraph, so if theoretically we this is about five flags. If theoretically we either appoint somebody, would that person then have to be up on this for a special election on the neck on the referendum for five flags if that happens? So if you appointed someone to the spot, they would appear on the ballot in September if you proceeded with the five flags referendum in September of 2022. Okay, so, okay, all right. And if theoretically, can we run, can you provide uh, the next example? If, if we were to hold a special election for this seat, when, when would that election have to be? 32 days. I believe um, 
Adrian has talked with Jenny Hillary, so I will let her speak to that. Sure. Adrian Breitfelder, city clerk, um, based on initial discussions with Jenny Hillary, deputy commissioner of elections for Dubuque County, um, we have discussed a potential date of March 29th for a special election. Um, if we were to go with that date, then a primary would occur on March 1st if needed. Um, I would advise that this date does depend on us giving the county um, proper notice of the election. Um, I believe that would have to be done no later than uh, mid-January. Um, and basically what that notice means is council would have to formally adopt the resolution calling for the special election. We then provide that to the county. They select the election date based on when we provided it. But as mentioned, based on discussions with Jenny, uh, March 29th looks to be a solid date for the election. Okay. So we would theoretically then have only six people on council for budget session. If if my if the pr proposed dates are correct, that is correct. If you if council chooses to proceed with a special election, there would be a vacancy until the election. Okay. okay. Oh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, uh, yes, there's so many options uh, that uh, it's good to hear uh, others' opinion about this. Um, so, if we were to have an election, I would like to have somebody appointed though up to that point so that uh, the fourth ward has representation. Um, I know that uh, Mr. Jones and myself and uh, Mayor Kavanaugh will be uh, also representing them. But uh, I do think it's important to have another voice during budgets uh, and another perspective. I enjoy seven perspectives of here, not six. So that's always uh, a really good idea. So my, whenever we um, hold the special election, which I appreciate, um, and I would like to have it, uh, I think right now, maybe it's just me, but I've been electioned out. <laughs> you know, we have all lots of elections and we keep coming while there be a primary. And then uh, I would love it if we could combine it with something to get folks out and uh, not have this go under the wire. Because if we have another election with 4% turnout, yes, we can say we got some input from fourth ward citizens, but not a lot. I think if we if we team it up with the five flags, if we have an appointee until the five flags referendum, I think people will be motivated by that uh, referendum and get maybe 10, 15, 20 percent uh, represent, you know, uh, of uh, fourth ward citizens to weigh in on this. I mean, I'm amenable to many things. I just I'm just hoping that we uh, make sure we remember fourth ward uh, representation. Uh, more voices at this table are good, and uh, more people uh, casting ballots are also good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I have a comment on that. Okay, I okay. want to make a comment first. Okay. Uh, I think if, uh, you know, if there's to be, an, and I don't have a horse in this race, if there's to be an appointment, I think that that person has to uh, recuse himself from running for the office because that gives whoever you appoint a leg up in any election going forward. So, you know, like we did, uh, I think the last vacancy when you know, we were going to appoint someone and, uh, you know, they weren't going to run for office. But, uh, and that was my point, too, oh, is that um, yeah. I had already, I went through that entire process as well and presented my credentials and uh, garnered a few votes as well. So then I knew that I had some um, reason to continue with with my uh, motive to serve and my interest to serve. Um, but I do think that unless that person is one who does not wish to uh, run for office, that it would be, as you said, um, I don't think it would be as appropriate as to just hosting or holding the special election. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm, <laughs> i got to see if I can get some consensus here on... Uh, is, oh, Mr. Mr. Jones, go ahead. Good evening. Um, I, I'd like to see a, a hybrid like was talked about. I, I think uh, finding a, a citizen from the fourth ward that doesn't desire to, to run an election but has some leadership qualities and would, would be willing to step forward and fill the interim um, has a tremendous advantage for the citizens of the fourth ward. Um, but I also think that uh, an election is the way to go. We're talking about a long period of time for this person to serve. Um, so I would support the special election at the earliest date possible, but an interim appoint, appointment of a disinterested candidate um, 
as soon as, as soon as reasonably possible after the, the first of the year. Okay. I, th I think I was hearing something along that line from a lot of the uh, comments earlier, you know, that an election first opportunity, um, you know, if, if there's someone that, uh, you know, is, is uh, I guess, up on the issues or someone that, you know, that has uh, some respect for their opinion that we, you could appoint, I, I think that's the way to go for that interim period, but they couldn't be on the ballot. I have a question about that, Mr. Head. Um, so I guess this is a, a, a question for Krenna. I mean, it can... Technically, can we do that? I mean, can we say that this that we can appoint a person and then outline, uh, you know, an addendum to that that says that person is not allowed to run? I mean, legally, is that possible? So I don't think that you could specifically um, limit it to or put language in there that says someone is um, that, that they can't run. Um, but if you were to explore a hybrid, the way I think that would work is the council would provide direction to staff and we would prepare a resolution for the next meeting in December, which would indicate council's intent to appoint someone when the vacancy occurs in January to serve until the special election on March 29th. And then after the vacancy occurs in January, um, staff would provide a resolution related to the special election because we can't actually uh, do a resolution or have you vote on that until the vacancy exists. So that that is what your hybrid would look like from an action standpoint. It would be a December 20th resolution to get the, the notice in the newspaper and accept applications. You could appoint someone in January to serve through that March 29th date, but um, we, we wouldn't be able to put anything in there saying that you you will only consider people who who won't run. You could indicate a preference towards that, of course, but uh, it that wouldn't necessarily stop someone who you had appointed from filing papers and running. So in that case, I mean, I, I love the idea of this. I really do. I think it makes sense. Um, but I also think that it, I mean, really, if you look at the technical details of it, it really just could potentially put us in the fourth ward in a position that, that you outlined, Mr. Mayor, that would be the challenge. We could appoint somebody who then could run for the seat and we had just given that person a leg up. Um, I get, you know, and, and I and and I trust me. I know that I'm the one sitting closest to this, so um, you know, I I very much respect everybody's opinion on this. It's just that I understand that seven voices are better than six. That is absolutely true. But at the same time, I don't think it's the worst thing um, for this council if we were to call for a special election and then go through the budget process, go through the hearings. Um, you know, somebody who's serious about running for this position would obviously be paying close attention and hopefully be here for the hearings to be able to be a part of that um, in any way that they could. But um, I, I think it would be, I think it'd be much more fair if we were to just have a special election and call that the, the decision that we make. I agree with that. And again, I'm the uh, only one here that's kind of w recently gone through this experience. <laughs> and I strongly support the idea of six votes for a two and a half months. I don't consider that a hardship. And I think that we've got some very talented council people here, and I think that we work well together and we will uh, serve the citizens of Dubuque well during this budget process. And also, I think it would be very awkward and difficult for someone to come in for two and a half months and quote unquote, try to bring them up to speed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you all know from going through uh, Goal setting, you know, it's a pretty involved process. Yeah. And for someone to step in and try and to then, figure yeah. that all out. Yeah. Well, what's the consensus of the others? Uh, I support uh, the special election. And as Brad said, uh, encourage those candidates to be part of the budget discussions. Um, and that would be my vote.
it seems lopsided, <laughs> but I, I get it. I, by the, with the timing and how the state's kind of tied our hands, we have limited options on this. So, I mean, the majority sounds like we are okay with having basically six, six on council. I guess we can survive. So, till March, till the end of March, essentially. So, Mr. Jones, do you have any input? Yeah, I, I think uh, just uh, just setting a special election and creating the invitation for people interested in serving or interested in running to be sure that they participate in that budget process and be in chambers and ask some questions and or at least absorb the information. Okay. Oh, I'm hearing at least six. Well, I think that's the direction. Okay. Um, okay, I guess we need to take a vote on the receiving file of the item. Adrian? Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion carries 7 0. Good discussion. Action item number four is 9 1 321.1 ordinance revision. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Kavanaugh. Yeah, I move to receive and file and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Roussel. Motion by Ms. Kavanaugh, second by Ms. Roussel. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. City Attorney Crenna Brumwell recommends City Council approval of an ordinance amending the definition section of Title IX regarding motor vehicles and traffic revisions to ensure the city code is consistent with state code. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. You have any discussion? Okay, the motion is to waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion carries 7-0. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Kavanaugh. I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Roussel. Motion by Mr. Kavanaugh, second by Ms. Roussel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion carries 7-0. <clears throat> Action item number five is Police Department 2021 Commission on the Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies Accreditation Acceptance. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and view the presentation. Second by Farber. Motion by Ms. Roussel, second by Ms. Far uh, Ms. Farber. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Interim Chief of Police Jeremy Jensen is transmitting information on the Dubuque Police Department being awarded the 2021 Commission on the Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, or CALEA, reaccreditation. Since 1993, the Dubuque Police Department has passed all CALEA reviews to include the 2021 virtual review. In 1993, the Dubuque Police Department became the first law enforcement agency in Iowa to become accredited through the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, or CALEA. CALEA was created in 1979 as a credentialing authority through the joint efforts of law enforcement's major executive associations. CALEA's program and the seal awarded upon accreditation are marks of professional excellence for public safety agencies and reflects the gold standard in public safety. There are only 14 CALEA accredited law enforcement agencies in the state of Iowa. Since 1993, the Dubuque Police Department has received reaccreditation in 1998, 2001, 2004, 2007, 2010, 2013, 2016, and 2020. It should be noted that accreditation cycles have changed throughout the years and is currently on a four-year cycle and interim chief of police Jeremy Jensen has a brief presentation. Okay, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Jeremy Jensen, interim chief of police. Said so it's with great pleasure that I get to report that uh, we passed another annual accreditation review through CALEA. This year, 
uh, we did a virtual on-site, which consisted of 190 standards being reviewed. I would like to point out that this is not a small undertaking. It's a, it is, it takes quite a bit and it would not be possible without our accreditation managers, Corporal Steve Eastbed, who was our longtime manager, retired this summer and did a lot of the legwork to get it to that point and did a lot of the uh, full accreditation cycles that you heard about that the city manager talked about there. And then Corporal Ryan Sherman, who got a baptism by fire as he took over just as the virtual <laughs> accreditation was taking taking place. So why is this important to the city of Dubuque and the Dubuque Police Department? CALEA is a accreditation is a voluntary process. We choose to take part in this. And by participating in this, we are showing a commitment to our professionalism. Accreditation is intended to enhance our service capacities and effectiveness, serve as a tool for policy decisions and management, promote transparency and community trust, and establishes a platform for continuous review. By going through this, we're ahead of the curve on a lot of these policies. So this past year and a half, where duty to intervene and, and policies such as that were becoming new to law enforcement, we were ahead of the curve. We were already doing that stuff where chokeholds were banned, we were already had that in our policy. So by participating in this, we are staying ahead of the curve and we're staying at the top of the game. So I, I would, the city council has continuously supported us uh, through this for almost 30 years now that we've continuously done this. And so I would like to thank the council and past councils for your support and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you, Jeremy, uh, any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions here. Uh, thank you and congratulations. That's, uh, that's a pretty good record. Uh, I'm glad to see that Dubuque was one of the first cities, uh, the first city in Iowa to be accredited by Kalia. And Mayor, I'm sure it's not lost on anyone that um, now we both have a fire department and a police department that are fully accredited by an outside agency. Yes. Absolutely, and that says a lot for, for the quality of our staff. Thank you, thanks Jeremy. Thank you. Okay, the motion uh, is to receive and file. Uh, Adrian, please call the roll, please. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion carries 7 0. Action item number six is Carbon Disclosure Project 2021 scorecard. Mayor. Mr. Sprank. Yes, and I motion that we receive and file and listen to the presentation. Second. Motion by Mr. Sprank, second uh, by Mr. Kavanaugh. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Sustainable Community Coordinator Gina Bell is transmitting information regarding the City of Dubuque's 2021 Carbon Disclosure Project score. The Carbon Disclosure Project recently announced the 2021 scores and the City of Dubuque scored an A minus at the leadership level. While reporting is encouraged, free and important, significant staff time was devoted to gathering data and filling out the report. Reporting aligns with the city's 50% by 2030 plan, demonstrating the city's actionable efforts towards creating a more equitable, green, and economically strong community. The 2021 score represents an improvement over prior years reporting due to the continued work on implementing the 50% by 2030 plan, as well as improved data collection and time committed to reporting. And uh, the Sustainable Community Coordinator, Gina Bell, has a brief presentation. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. If I can be permission to share my screen. All right, good evening, Gina Bell, Sustainable Community Coordinator. I'm here to discuss our 2021 score uh, with the Carbon Disclosure Project, or CDP. CDP is a nonprofit entity that runs the global disclosure system for investors, companies, cities, states, and regions to manage 
their environmental impacts. The world economy looks to CDP as the gold standard of environmental reporting with the most comprehensive data set on corporate and city action. CDP's mission and vision is to see a thriving economy that works for people and planet in the long term. And they focus investors, companies, cities, and governments on building a sustainable economy by measuring and acting on their environmental impact. As you may have heard me say, we must act urgently to slow uh, climate change impacts and environmental damage. And that starts by being aware of our impacts so cities and governments can make the right choices immediately. More than a thousand cities reported their environmental impacts in 2021 and 965 cities received a rating for their climate action. CDP score is an indication of both completeness of your response as well as your performance on climate action. Scoring allows CDP to recognize leadership in city climate action and encourage cities to follow best practices. Each section of the questionnaire falls into either adaptation, mitigation, or both themes. And adaptation is the process of preparing for and adjusting proactively to climate change by reducing vulnerability. So a local example of that is our flood wall or the B branch um, with the city preparing for additional flooding due to increased um, superstorms and, um, and then helping to reduce flooding vulnerabilities. And then mitigation is the process by which cities reduce emissions and transform to a low carbon economy. And a local example is our work moving towards electrification of the city's fleet. So we received both an adaptation score and a mitigation score, and then an overall score, which indicates the overall level of our climate disclosure and performance. And in 2021, as city manager Van Milligan mentioned, we received an A minus in all sections. Um, and as you can see from the chart above, this was a great improvement from past years. Dubuque strives to be data-driven and reporting to CDP aligns with that goal. Dis Experimental data through CDP helps us to improve our citizen engagement, centralized data, and track our progress related to our climate action plan. CDP also provides us with publicly available data, evaluates our response, benchmarks our performance against our peers, and also offers opportunities for the city to continue to improve. We report in the following categories, city governance, climate hazards and vulnerability, adaptation, citywide emissions and emissions reduction, energy, transportation, food, waste, and water security. And those familiar with our 50% by 2030 community climate action and resiliency plan will see the overlap of categories with the way our climate action plan is organized. So you can see that we've achieved a leadership level, not quite an A, but almost there. And this shows that we've demonstrated best practices, we set goals and we're making progress towards the goals. We have plans in place to reduce climate impacts and we continue to serve as an example and a leadership and an, in a leadership role for Iowa and our region. That said, we still have work to do. Um, there are 34 North American cities that received an A um, and worldwide there were 61 cities that received an A. And A-list cities report twice as many climate mitigation and adaptation measures as non-A-listers. Um, and 81% of the A-list cities collaborate with businesses on their climate action. So those give us some things to strive for. Um, and it also helps us to reaffirm our commitment to a net zero future and um, supports renewed leadership at both the local and federal level. Iowa City is the only city in Iowa that achieved an A this year. So it's important to note that CDP is time consuming. Um, I want to make sure I publicly thank Alexis Pfeiffer for my, she was uh, my summer intern and she spent many hours working on this. Um, and reporting is important though, because it helps us continue to track implementation of our goals, our opportunities, and climate action in general and share with the residents of Dubuque and our world that we continue to have a commitment to sustainability and climate action. Thank you. 
Yeah. Thank you, Gina, and thank you for all the uh, the work and the success that you've had in achieving the uh, that A minus. I know there's a lot of partners that made that uh, that happen for the city. So thank them all for us. Anyone have any questions for Gina? Okay. Uh, thank you very much again, Gina, and keep up the good work. Okay. The motion is to receive and file. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Council Member Jones? Aye. Thank you. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion carries 7 0. Action item number seven is Fall 2021 City Focus Magazine. Mr. Mayor, I yes, move Ms. that Farber. we receive and file. Second by Sprank. Motion by Ms. Farber, second by Mr. Sprank. You don't have any presentation, do you, Mike? No, sir. Okay, that's a, that's a great uh, city focus. There's a lot of information in that. Okay, uh, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion carries 7 0. <clears throat> Action item number eight is acceptance of national endowment for the Arts American Rescue Plan grants to local arts agencies for subgranting funding offer. Mr. Mayor? Yes, yeah, Mr. Resnick, please. Uh, yes, I move to receive and file and approve. Second by Roussel. Motion by Mr. Resnick, second by Ms. Roussel. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan, Arts and Cultural Affairs Coordinator Jenny Peterson Brantz recommends City Council acceptance of a $500,000 funding offer from the National Endowment for the Arts American Rescue Plan to local arts agencies for subgranting funding program. This grant award will provide the Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs with funds to competitively distribute by November 30th, 2023 as follows. $435,000 to eligible local arts and culture nonprofits for allowable operating support expenses, and $15,000 to individual creatives residing in Dubuque for career advancing arts and cultural projects that also align with Dubuque's arts and culture master plan. In addition, $50,000 of the award has been budgeted for the administration of the National Endowment for the Arts Award and the above subgranting programs including the recruitment and hiring of part-time staff through the end of the project period on November 30th, 2023. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval, and Jenny will have a short presentation. Okay, thanks, Mike. Hello, good evening, uh, City Council, Mayor and City Council. Uh, this is Jenny Peterson Brandt, Arts and Cultural Affairs Coordinator for the City of Dubuque. Um, I don't have a visual presentation this evening, so I'll just be speaking to you a little bit about this grant program and the funding that we've been approved to receive. So the City of Dubuque is amongst um, one of 66 local arts agencies that was approved to receive a part of the $20.2 million in Federal American Rescue Plan Act funds that will be distributed through this local arts agencies for subgranting award program. Of those 66 communities, <coughs> Dubuque is one of just 24 that was approved for the $500,000 maximum funding level alongside other communities like Tucson, Arizona, Chicago, Illinois, New Orleans, Louisiana, Seattle, Washington, Madison, Wisconsin, and others noted that were noted in my full memo uh, on the, this evening's agenda. Uh, of those, Dubuque actually serves the smallest population center and is the only community in Iowa to have received any funding, um, any level of funding through this program. I did want to note that we um, we have neighboring communities in neighboring states that were approved for funding through this program. So Evanston, Illinois, and Rockford, Illinois, both were approved for $150,000. Madison, as I mentioned, received one of the $500,000 grants. Duluth, Minnesota, and Colorado, Missouri. Um, there were no awards made in Nebraska or South Dakota, which were our other neighbors. Um, so one of the, some of the things that I just wanted to highlight that 
actually made us eligible for this award and it's a big thank you um, and a just a kudos to the city of Dubuque, to the city council and to the forethought they've put into supporting arts and culture as one of the tools that moves our city forward. Um, we were only eligible to apply for this award because we were we can be defined by the National Endowment for the Arts as a local arts agency, which to them means that um, we have an we have an arm of the city. Um, in the sense of the Arts and Cultural Affairs Advisory Commission, which is recognized with an ordinance to act on behalf um, and in service to the city of Dubuque. Um, although the Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs is not designated as its own department or division, um, it does function and have its own budget in supporting act, arts and cultural initiatives of the city of Dubuque. Um, we were also eligible because of the city's history of grant making to the arts and culture sector. And we, as a local arts agency, you had to have um, had grant making history within the last 10 years of, of your agency. And we also had to be in good standing with the NEA. So the last uh, National Endowment for the Arts Award that we received, which was an Our Town grant um, in partnership with Dubuque. Uh, Main Street. Uh, kudos to everyone involved with that, that they did what they were supposed to and got all their final reporting and spent the funds <laughs> like they were supposed to with that award. So we were in good standing with the NEA. Um, some of the things that we think really strengthened our case and in talking with um, NEA staff, they were very, they commented that the reviewers were very pleased with the established practices and systems that we already have in place in the city for, of Dubuque for granting to the arts and culture sector. Um, we also, within the city of Dubuque, as we know that because we have had the level of grant making in the past that we that we do, it made a case for us to ask for the $500,000 award. And we also pointed to in the in our application that the city has an arts and culture master plan, that we have an equitable poverty reduction and prevention plan, and that the city continues to prioritize and invest in cultivating diverse, um, diverse access and inclusive arts and cultural experiences. So as city manager Van Milligan mentioned, the $500,000 grant will provide for $435,000 to be subgranted out to established and eligible arts and culture nonprofit organizations in the city of Dubuque. Those grants will be awarded competitively and organizations will be able to spend those funds on staff wages and benefits, fees or stipends that are paid to artists or contractual personnel, that support the subgrantees day-to-day -day operations for facilities costs such as rent and utilities, for costs associated with health and safety supplies for staff, visitors, and audiences, and also for marketing and promotional costs. Um, we do anticipate that we'll, we'll be able to grant funds to, to 20 to 24 organizations. Um, there are some, uh, different eligibility requirements as a subgranting organiz uh, as subgrantees receiving federal money that might impact some of our local organizations but we're excited that we do have a wealth of organizations to be able to support um, in terms of the individual artist grant program that fifteen thousand dollars we will be using that to create a new grant program we currently don't have programs that support individual creatives in the community so this will create something new for them um, to propose projects that have very specific be beginning and end dates. And as uh, city manager mentioned, that they are projects that um, advance people's careers and align with the strategies of the arts and culture master plan. A couple things that I wanted to note is that the as we subgrant these funds, they cannot. We will not be use, using them for relief programs to alleviate financial hardships or recoup mm -hmm. for lost revenues. That are just guidelines with the NEA's program. And our re review criteria also has to include an evaluation of artistic excellence or artistic mer merit. Um, in terms of timeline for disbursement of these funds. 
one of our first steps will be looking to recruit and secure an individual using that um, 50,000 in administrative costs that were part of the budget to um, recruiting and securing that person to help support with the creation and administration of these subgranting programs. And that'll be happening early next year. And then we will be working with the grant subcommittee of the Arts and Cultural Affairs Advisory Commission to create guidelines and review criteria in anticipation of supporting uh, the grant programs, um, the operational support and those individual projects occurring sometime um, uh, after July 1 of 2022, but all of the funding being spent by November 30th of 2023. Um, lastly, I just wanted to say a special thank you publicly to the city's director of strategic partnerships, Terry Goodman, for her incredible encouragement in pursuing this application. And I also wanted to thank Mickey Robinson of our local Bell Tower Theater and Andy Seth of S Sustainable Strategies DC <laughs> for their assistance in the application project process. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jenny. And uh, believe me, all the, the hard work you put in has not been lost on the council. We know how important you are to the arts community. And thank you for all that uh, you did to lead that effort. So, Anyone have any questions? Yes, Mr. Yeah, Kavanaugh. I, yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, I, I just can't pass up the opportunity to, I mean, it's feeling really lonely in here right now. There's, <laughs> I don't know if anybody else can, you can't see at home, but there's, we're, we're pretty alone here in the, in the council chambers. And, it, and I know it's getting late. And we want to keep moving, but the last th like the last three items that we just got, I'm just so impressed by our city staff. I mean, this, we've got a police department that went through a really difficult accreditation process. We moved from a C to an A minus in our carbon disclosure project with a staff of one of Gina Bell and working in tandem with everybody in the in the in the city. But um, five hundred thousand dollars, and I mean, you look at this list of other cities. I mean, this is incredibly impressive. And Jenny, I just want to say how impressed I am with the work that you've done, but especially the team you put together of within the community. You know, I mean, the ability to be able to do this is is going to be. I mean, this is huge for Dubuque, and I just I, I just wanted us to stop and say how impressed we are right now with the the city staff and everything that's going on. Because and. And I know we all we all feel the same way, but I just I felt the need to say it in such a quiet, late environment this time of the night. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's good to express your feelings. Yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, the motion is uh, to receive and file. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Buell. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. That motion carries 7-0. Action item number nine is release of RFP for design of the Dubuque Industrial Center project at U.S. Highway 151-61-52 interchange. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. Yes, I move to receive and file and approve. Second by Farber. Motion by Mr. Resnick, second by Ms. Farber. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Development Director Jill Connors recommends City Council approval to release a request for proposals for the design of the Dubuque Industrial Center project at U.S. Highway 151-61-52 interchange. The selected consultant will be expected to complete the contracted scope of work within a specified time frame under the general direction and coordination of the City's Economic Development Department and Engineering Department as authorized by the City Council. The goal is to complete the phase one grading design and initiate the public bidding process for construction of the phase one improvements by May 2nd, 2022. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Do you have any discussion? Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. We carry 7-0. Action item number 10 is request to schedule work session on arts and culture master plan update. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. Yes, I move to receive and file and set and schedule the work session for Monday, February 14th at 6.30. Second. Um, motion by Mr. Resnick, second by Mr. Kavanaugh. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Barber? Aye. Kavanaugh? 
Aye. Sprank? Aye. Fuel? I can't participate, but I'll vote aye. <laughs> <laughs> Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion carries 7 0. Action item number 11 is travel Dubuque update work session request. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and schedule a work session for Monday, February 21st, 2022 at 6 p.m. Second by Sprank. Motion by Mr. Resnick, second by Mr. Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Barber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Buell. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. That motion carries 7-0. Next are council member reports. Any council member reports? Mr. Sell? <clears throat> I'd like to say thank you for the opportunity to attend the National League of Cities Fall Conference, uh, virtually of course, and special kudos to uh, Mr. Kavanaugh for presenting um, on Dubuque's great sustainability work on electrification. Um, he did a great job, so thank you. It, it's always great to hear what other cities are doing and kind of uh, think about how Dubuque shines, really, when we compare ourselves to those other communities. Um, I also participated in the Iowa League of Cities Legislative Policy Committee uh, discussion on economic development and just to, uh, talk to our city staff and those at Greater Dubuque to find out how I can better um, advocate for Dubuque in my participation in that committee. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Mayor? Mr. Resnick? Quickly, I just wanted to comment on a, an opportunity we had tonight, right before the meeting, and uh, we were able to get tours of the um, automated side loader uh, for picking up trash, and um, it's really kind of semi-automated because we do have an operator working uh, to uh, uh, really hone in on that uh, you know, it's, they're going to be really able to uh, do so much more with picking up trash with this automated. The arm comes out, uh, the very skilled operator just grabs it and uh, tosses it, gives it a little shake if there's anything sticking there, and then and put it back down. And it's really nifty. And I think uh, I just want to let uh, citizens know they may see them prowl in the uh, city uh, early morning. And uh, it's a uh, it's really going to be, help our, our our staff. Um, with these repetitive injuries. And I've often looked out the, the window at like 6.30 in the morning when they come by. And uh, these, uh, these workers just are really working hard and they've got some really tricky things to carry sometimes. And I, I'm glad that we're able to uh, give this pilot program um, a start and hopefully we can do more with those. Thank you. You bet, thank you. Anyone else? I do know those arms uh, that you were referring to, uh, that automatic arm, that I can imagine there'd be some uh, jockeying for position to get on that truck because you don't have to get out in the middle of the winter and step on <laughs> ice and everything to empty the cans. So <laughs> it'd be good to, to hear how that works out through the winter. Okay, uh, we do have a closed session. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Cavanaugh. I move that uh, council enter closed session to discuss the purchase or sale of real estate uh, pursuant to chapter 21 of the Code of Iowa. Second by Sprank. Motion by Mr. Cavanaugh, second by Mr. Sprank. And for the record, the attorney of the city council will consult uh, with on the issues to be discussed in the closed session is city attorney Crenna Brumwell. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Buell? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion carries 7-0. We are in closed session.